Jimenez. Morales. Jimenez is present. Thank you. Perales. Here. Cohen. Here. Carrasco. Here. Davis. Here. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Foley. Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. Cardo. Present. You have a quorum. All right, thank you, Tony. All right, let's uh, start with the item that I know many members of the community are waiting for. That's 5.2, the Community Forest Management Plan. We're going to a presentation. I'll just warn my colleagues, we'll be strictly enforcing the 10 minute limits just so we can try to uh, make sure we can all get to the finish line uh, having completed our work uh, at midnight. Uh, so thank you and welcome John and Rick. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. who's taking this. Yeah, thanks Mayor John Risto, Director of Transportation. Good evening. Uh, Mayor and Council. Today, we are very pleased to present the Community Forest Management Plan, a plan to protect, preserve, and plant trees in San Jose to improve our urban forest tree canopy. With me today to present the plan is Rick Scott, Deputy Director of Infrastructure Management in the Department of Transportation, Russ Hansen, the City Arborist in DOT, and Ryan Allen with DUDEC. He was a principal author of the report. Before we get started, I, I just wanted to provide a little bit of background and also thank our many partners that helped us with this. First, the city DOT proactively initiated this independent evaluation of the city's entire tree program. The evaluation was purposely scoped to take a hard look at what the city does well and what needs improvement. We didn't shy away at all from taking this hard look at our practice, practices because we knew we needed to make changes and improvements to reverse the decline in the city's urban forest. We are actually very proud of the work done on the plan and look forward to implementing these changes over the next months and years. Secondly, I do want to thank the many stakeholders and partners who through their involvement, suggestions and comments, we were able to really strengthen the plan. In particular, thanks goes to our city forest, Cal Fire, Open Space Authority, Audubon Society, and many others. So we look forward to working with all of these partners to protect, preserve, plant our way to a robust urban forest for city of San Jose. So with that, I think Russ, are you ready to start the presentation and we're ready to go? Thank you, Mayor, back to the presentation. Sure. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and the count members of the council for letting us kind of have some discussions with you this evening. But uh, go ahead and get started with just some basic information here that I think we're all somewhat familiar with. But, um, you know, the slide above is really just meant to represent the many benefits that we receive from our trees. Um, they clean our air by capturing air pollution. Uh, they combat climate change by lowering energy demand and reducing the CO2 in the atmosphere. They capture and clean stormwater reducing the, the demand on other public infrastructure. They've been shown to both improve or improve both physical and mental health. And most critically for us, um, you know, recent studies have shown that the urban environment across California has got $3.3 billion in economic value within its forests. So bottom line is trees are an integral part of the public infrastructure that provide a significant benefit and increase in value when they're properly maintained over time. Rick, next one, please. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> so the, the next slide again, just kind of present um, the benefits of trees that uh, when we start to take a little more closely, look a little bit more closely at the benefit our trees provide, it's important to note that there's a significant difference in the benefits provided by large trees when we compare them to our smaller trees. In fact, for large trees, the benefits can be six to, time, six to seven times greater than those provided by small trees. So it really reinforces to us that it's important not just to plant more trees, but to ensure that they thrive to maturity and provide the maximum benefits provide or max, maximum benefits possible. Excuse me. Next one, Rick. <clears throat> So this side here is kind of represents the current composition of our urban forest within San Jose. Um, you can see in, in looking at it in a little bit of detail here that about 90% of our commu current community forest um, is comprised of mostly small to moderately sized trees um, that really only 10% of the forest 
is the large trees that provide that maximum benefit. So uh, this means overall that really we're getting less shade, less stormwater, less pollution mitigation, and less value from our trees than if we were maintaining them and growing them into maturity where they can provide those benefits. So the key takeaway for me in all of this is that you know it takes 30, more, 30 years or more for most trees to reach maturity. So it really is critical that we properly design, plant, and maintain our trees to maximize the benefits that they're providing. <laughs> Next one, Rick. So this slide here is kind of a uh, overview of the Community Forest Management Plan itself. Um, it was initiated by the Department of Transportation in alignment with the strategies identified in our strategic framework for the San Jose Community Forest Master Plan. Uh, the plan itself was funded by CAL FIRE using climate investment funds and consists of really three major components. Uh, a SWOT or strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats analysis, a strategic work plan, and then updates to our tree policy and best practices manual. So the plan itself is meant to provide some guidance for improving the overall city's tree program and is the support document to key city policies and goals such as the 2040 general plan, climate smart, green stormwater, and DOT's vision zero plan. So lastly, I just wanted to note um, that the current plan itself uh, is viewed by CAL FIRE as one of the biggest steps that we've taken in San Jose for proper preparing for the activities. So, next one. so the overall project itself um, of which the management plan is one component was a multi-year effort with certain key deliverables that included, again, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis for the citywide tree programs, an update to the tree policy manual, and then up, uh, other deliverables included, excuse me, a project to plant 200 trees in underserved communities the development of a tree management database within DOT and the completion of a full inventory for the city maintained trees. So finding the recommendations of the SWOT analysis and strategic plan, our work plan, excuse me, are what we're here to kind of present to you today. today. Um, at this point, I'll kind of turn it over to Brian Allen with DUDEC Environmental to present some of those findings from the SWOT analysis. Brian? Thank you, Russell. And uh, council members, it's a pleasure to be here this evening um, speaking with you all about the Community Forest Management Plan. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, I'm a consulting arborist and urban forester with DUDEC, um, an ISA certified arborist. I've been doing uh, community and urban forestry work for the last 13 years and, uh, and the lead author for this uh, Community Forest Management Plan. Um, as mentioned, the Community Forest Management Plan was developed um, using a very thorough SWOT analysis of all aspects that relate to management of the community forest. The approach that we undertook um, is very similar to that that we've used in other management plan development projects, um, like the one that we completed for the City of Los Angeles. The process began, uh, we conducted 15 interviews with representatives from council offices, um, DOT, PRNS, Public Works, uh, Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement, the Office of the City Attorney and, and our City Forest. Uh, we reviewed city ordinances and policies that govern trees on both public and private property. We reviewed related city documents like the Envision San Jose 2040 General Plan, Climate Smart San Jose, Urban Village Plans, and the Green Stormwater Infrastructure Plan to understand how goals of the CFMP can be integrated into those plans as well. We analyzed the city inventory data against urban forest sustainability metrics like species diversity, age distribution, and health composition to understand if the city managed inventory is resilient to emerging threats and prepared to meet climate change conditions. We analyzed the budget, staffing, and management practices to, to determine if the necessary resources are directed towards developing and maintaining a sustainable urban forest. And then finally, we engaged the community through various online meetings and surveys, social media, and met with key stakeholders to learn more about the values and priorities of San Jose residents. The key findings uh, presented on this slide 
are the main challenges and opportunities facing the city in progressing towards a sustainable urban forest. First, we see that tree, can tree canopy cover has declined from 15.3% to 13.5%. Um, over a six year period from 2012 to 2018. Uh, we found that economically disadvantaged communities have fewer trees and an increased vulnerability to environmental and health impacts. Uh, tree staffing and maintenance is underfunded and very low compared to equivalent cities. Urban infill and development practices like limit space for tree canopy growth. There are opportunities for the city and our city force to strengthen and expand its partnership. And finally, a complete inventory for public space and street trees is needed. This <clears throat> figure represents canopy cover across the city's 10 council districts. 20% canopy cover can be considered a baseline for a city like San Jose that was developed on land that was once grassland and chaparral, otherwise an area that was not already forested or heavily treed. And as this figure shows, all council districts are below the 20% baseline um, with council districts four and seven having the lowest canopy cover. Uh, this graph represents the canopy cover change by council districts from 2012 to 2018. The gray line on the chart is 2012 canopy cover and blue line is uh, 2018 canopy cover. Uh, this figure represents that all council districts have experienced a loss of canop canopy cover during that time period um, with council districts 10, one and five having the greatest uh, loss of canopy cover. The strategic work plan is led by the vision statement and guiding principles that were developed uh, based on consultation with the city and through the community engagement process to reflect the values and priorities the city and residents have for the community force. The strategies and objectives are directed towards the various guiding principles so the actions the city takes will meet an established priority. Uh, the strategic work plan identifies the following strategies for creating and maintaining a sustainable urban forest. Um, one, streamlining the governance structure, ensuring community forest sustainability, supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion, funding the community forest, efficient and effective management, and standardizing and improving planning and development. And with that, we'll turn it back over to Russell. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. So this slide here is really kind of documenting the various roles that uh, the departments and, and our nonprofit kind of play within the community forest and managing of the, the trees in our forest. Um, as you can see, the management is scattered across multiple departments, creating confusions for both residents as well as staff alike. So it should be noted um, that while many departments have responsibility for trees, DOT is currently the only department which has arborists on staff, and they're frequently called upon by these other departments to kind of support their tree-related concerns. So um, we also want to make special note of our nonprofit uh, tree planting partner here, Our City Forest, and the role that they play with getting that uh, community outreach and engagement for us, as well as planting trees and helping to get them stewarded so that we get them established really, really well. So. Um, last thing we would kind of point out on the bottom of the graphic here is that um, noted within the CFMP or the management plan is um, the, the need potentially for a community forest advisory committee. Um, among the many things this committee would be taxed with is the supporting the review of the structure of this organization as well as the kind of determining if consolidation is appropriate or if other governmental agencies have identified a more successful model um, and then using that to kind of vision an own, our own model for the city of San Jose. So next slide here again, talking about our city forest. Um, our city forest was founded in 90, 1994 to advance urban forestry in San Jose. Um, they've assisted us by obtaining over $15 million in urban, $15 million in urban forestry grants. They've leveraged another $25 million in volunteer time through their planting efforts and otherwise. They've educated over 40,000 elementary and middle school students. 
They planted over 80,000 trees and shrubs citywide. And also they operate a community nursery that really supports um, our tree diversity or our tree species diversity efforts that we're trying to accomplish here. So next slide, Rick, thank you. Um, this one here is really talking about sustainability of the forest through proper maintenance. Um, when it comes to caring for the community forest, industry research has shown that regular pruning is one of the most critical maintenance activities that can be, formed, can be performed to improve sustainability. Um, that regular maintenance leads to a healthy and structurally sound trees that have an opportunity to grow into those large trees we kind of talked about earlier. And it helps us to identify problems much earlier in the process, reducing both the risk of limb failure as well as complete tree failure when they're identified much earlier in the process. So um, while the industry best practice for pruning, um, uh, uh, excuse me, practice for tree pruning on an established tree is about five to seven years. Um, the current estimated pruning cycle for San Jose trees in public spaces is over a hundred years in many cases meaning many of those trees are not gonna be proactively pruned or maintained in their lifetime. So as you can see from the left side of the chart above, um, there are some other public agencies that we took a look at in California that are closer to the industry standard of five to seven years. In particular, it mentions you know, San Francisco and Sacramento that are very close, if not exceeding that kind of goal. And then Los Angeles, which is a little further down towards the 10 year cycle, um, but what really is significant to us when we took a look at this is that both Los Angeles and San Francisco have previously struggled with issues um, similar to us and have gone undergone similar reviews and evaluations and then subsequently received additional support through either their general fund programs or special ballot, special, excuse me, special ballot measures to improve the sustainability of their forests. So when we dig down into the details of it all and start talking about those maintenance spending needs, this table really kind of breaks it down um, as to what we see are the current estimated funding um, that's gonna be required to adequately implement a comprehensive tree program um, that includes regular inspection, pruning, removal, planting of replacement trees as needed, and then as, as well, emergency responses when they do um, still have failures or otherwise. So. Um, if we were to break that down into a little bit more manageable pieces, um, we can focus currently on the response of the trees for which the city of San Jose is currently responsible. Those are kind of the blue and yellow columns on the left hand side there. And we estimate that it's going to take about $3.6 million to $4 million in annual funding um, to deliver this comprehensive and proactive tree maintenance program on, uh, on about a six year cycle is what we're anticipating right there between the five and seven. So. Um, if we take that a little bit further, if the city wishes to take back responsibility for maintenance of the existing street trees for which they are currently responsible for, um, it's estimated that a, an, an additional almost $16 million in annual funding would be needed to achieve a six-year cycle for that portion of the program as well. When we talk about tree planting, um, you know, we, Ryan had mentioned the 20% the canopy go, cover goal um, earlier in the presentation here. Um, what this table does is really kind of show us um, the, the varying sizes of trees that could be used to kind of accomplish that. Um, as you can see, as the tree size increases, the quantity of trees that needed to be planted are, is going to decrease. So, you know, again, the larger the tree, the fewer that we'll need the more benefits that those larger trees are ultimately going to provide. So, um, you know, in practice, City of San Jose expects really that we will have to plant um, both a wide range of small and large species. Um, given the, the growing conditions that they would be planted in, we've got to be, uh, we need to recognize that and, and appreciate that and plant appropriately. Um, so we feel like an, an aggressive goal would be to plant between two and 5,000 trees on an annual basis to kind of reach that 20% um, canopy in about 30 years. So let's go a little bit further in terms of the cost to plant and establish a tree. Um, we've taken an opportunity to kind of break that down here for you and show you the current cost that we're paying for tree planting and establishment services. Um, it, it's really important to ensure that every tree is, that is planted is able to grow to maturity um, because it's more than just digging a hole and planting the tree and providing some occasional watering. Um, once we've planted a proper species in a good location, it is imperative that we, we perform establishment services such as watering, mulching, stake adjustments, 
and young tree pruning on a regular basis for at least the first three years um, to set this tree up for future success. So as you can see at the top, as we kind of have broken it down here, um, depending on the quantity of trees that we're planting and the locations that we're planting them in, um, we pay anywhere from about $425 to get a tree planted and established to upwards of $1,000 uh, or more when we have to plant or establish a new tree in these high traffic medians and other areas where it takes a little bit more coordination on our part. So um, when all factors are considered, ultimately staff needs Excuse me, when all factors considered, staff feels the current pricing under the existing OCF master agreement it is competitive to what other agencies are experiencing. Um, but we will continue to kind of evaluate that approach and to, to tree planting and uh, we'll return to the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee in April to provide an update on what we have found at that point. So beyond that, the outreach that we conducted for the plan, um, this is kind of a quick summary of that. that um, while we obtain substantial insight through our outreach efforts and surveys, um, it must be noted that COVID protocols had a significant impact on our ability to directly engage a large portion of that community. Um, as such, the community engagement has and will continue to adapt to the changes as staff organizes and collaborates with elected officials, the advisory committee, and other key stakeholders as uh, we move forward with this plan. So, um, as such, staff expects to provide annual updates to the t and &E committee, which will incorporate this feedback and provide uh, updates for our work plan items. So next one here we get into um, is kind of our roadmap that we've developed using the, the strategic work plan. Um, this is the primary or preliminary roadmap that was developed um, to protect mature trees where possible, preserve and maintain our current inventory and plant where necessary. Uh, the column on the left in yellow text um, is kind of what we previously discussed in terms of strategies uh, for uh, this uh, strategic work plan. And then to the right hand side are the individual key objectives that we've kind of identified uh, within the plan to move us toward a more sustainable community forest. Um, you know, to take this opportunity and point out a few key objectives there. Um, that are highlighted in the teal. Um, we expect to kind of focus on those over the next couple of years, depending on the feedback that we're receiving. Um, but ultimately, um, just to mention a few of those, it really is about consolidating the tree maintenance responsibilities. It's about increasing the canopy cover in our underserved communities or areas within the city, and then improving the protection and preservation of our existing and mature trees. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we start talking about our next steps, the next slide, Rick, if we could, thank you. Um, it, it really is to kind of wrap this all up for you. Um, we have a plan in place to plant over 250 trees in East San Jose that was funded during the fiscal year 21-22. Um, we have to finalize the procurement for the PRNS inventory and establish a master agreement that will also allow us to update our street, in, street tree inventory. Um, we, we have um, already kind of uh, allocated some funding set aside within DOT to add an assistant arborist that's going to support these early work plan efforts, including the formation of the Community Forest Advisory Committee and review of some of our policies and procedures. So um, beyond that, again, if we want to try and get that Community Forest Advisory Committee formed so that we can get some feedback from the community, um, we want to be able to evaluate the funding options to expedite these work plan items including the potential of obtaining yet another CAL FIRE grant. Um, they have another grant cycle in July that we hope to apply for that and get some additional assistance. And then ultimately we would use the fiscal 22-23 budget process to seek some additional increased funding for the city of San Jose maintain trees. So at this point, I'll kind of turn it back over to John to wrap this up a little more and then we'll get back to everybody with questions. Thanks, Russ. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the memos submitted by Mayor Licardo and Council Members Carrasco, Davis, Esparza, and Cohen, and another memo submitted by Council Member Mahan. Uh, administration has reviewed those memos, and we support all the recommendations that were included in both of, both of those memos. And thank you, Mayor. That concludes our presentation. Great. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Russell. Um, and, uh, and Ryan, thank you for your presentations. Let's go now to the public. Rashi Sharma.
Good evening, Mayor Licardo and Council members. My name is Rashi Sharma, and I am a member of the Environmental Action Committee for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. As a local high school student, I feel a sense of urgency to protect our trees and the ecosystem services trees provide. Native and some other suitable trees provide habitats for native birds and beneficial insect species. The San Francisco Estuary Institute studied protecting biodiversity in urban areas, finding that protected public lands are not enough to stop our mass extinction crisis. We must create habitat patches within urban areas and integrate greenness into our cities. The effects of climate change and loss of local biodiversity will only get worse for mine and the following generations if we do not enact real solutions now. Thank you for your consideration. Juliana Pendleton. Good evening, Mayor Licardo and Council Members. My name is Juliana Pendleton, and I am the Environmental Advocacy Assistant for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. We have participated in the process that resulted in the report in front of you all today, as well as met with meeting with staff. All along, we expressed the need to address the urban forests beyond street trees and to protect and increase use of native trees to promote biodiversity. We see a great need for continued engagement with stakeholders, including Mayor Licardo and council members proposal for a representative advisory group and additional funding to support implementing a CFMP. However, the CFMP in front of you all today does not adequately address habitat value nor emphasize native trees such as oaks, which support up to 100 other species. The Google Downtown West project plans to use primarily California native trees, and we hope San Jose will embrace this throughout the city. Thank you for your time. Sarah Billings. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Billings with the San Jose Downtown Association. I'm here to speak in support of the Community Forest Management Plan. The value of trees appreciates over time as laid out in the plan, and we recognize the importance of vegetation to areas such as public health and combating the effects of climate change. We appreciate all the time and effort that was put into this document. We also appreciate the desire to improve San Jose as a whole, and we look forward to working together with our partners to implement the plan. Thank you to all who contributed, and thank you for your time today. Mark Landgraf. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Mark Landgraf, Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. We support approval of the CFMP and the items in the memo from Mayor Licardo and Council Members Carrasco, Esparza, Davis, and Cohen. We agree with the staff memo that there's a need for immediate action to reverse the trend of declining canopy cover. Also, the factors that have the greatest impact on the reduction of canopy must be identified and a zero net canopy loss policy created. Investment in San Jose's tree canopy to fight urban heat island is crucial, especially for its most vulnerable residents. We know resources are tight, but funding should be allocated in next year's budget to steward trees in the public realm and reduce the burden on residents. We would like to participate in the advisory group, though specific objectives need to be defined. We strongly encourage partnership with the County Office of Sustainability, Urban Forestry Alliance, and Open Space Authority to pool resources and jointly attract outside funding. And importantly, highly effective organizations like Our City Forest must be part of plan implementation. Thank you. Irma Baldross. Irma Baderas, board chair of Our City Forest. Uh, thank you for mentioning tree equity. Our City Forest could use the city's help with its decade-long efforts on this. I became an Our City Forest volunteer in 1997 and saw firsthand Our City Forest work planting trees throughout East San Jose parks and schools, all paid for with state grants. We recently completed planting 1,500 shade trees for this initiative and will soon begin another to plant 1,500 more again with state funds, but we need your help. We care deeply about tree equity and about the future of trees in San Jose. Every dollar you invest in our city forest leverages many times more. To address the tree equity gap, please work with us and support us. Don't adopt a document that is afraid to give you these facts. Thank you. Uh, Rhonda Berry. Good evening, honorable. Mayor and Council, the draft in the mayor's memo recommends a, a DOT managed advisory committee. We believe this would be the weakest form of public participation and wouldn't provide accountability. 
Uh, these groups are just too easy to ignore. The department would be advising itself without objective input. Other cities have a tree commission with greater responsibility, more authority, and with staff reporting to the mayor or city manager. These tree advocates would be dedicated to reaching your goals around tree protection and a 20% canopy. These goals cannot be achieved doing business as usual, and we urge you not to spend more funding at what is not working. There are excellent models for tree commissions, but they are not presented, and you deserve better information to make positive change. Please don't adopt as a plan a document that doesn't guide you. Thank you. Bob Levy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Bob Levy. I'm a former planning commissioner and parks commissioner. This document has a tremendous amount of valuable information and recommendations, more recommendations than the city can complete in a decade. But the document is a report and not a plan. A plan contains concrete tasks, resource requirements, and timelines for obtaining a specific goal. In order to complete the steps required to implement a no net loss policy, we still are missing some basic information such as why are we losing the canopy, the true cost of replacing and maintaining trees, and how, how to mitigate the loss of full grown trees. I would like to see the document evolve from a report to a plan by completing the collection of data and making rec and prioritizing recommendations and identifying the staff re requirements needed to complete specific measurable tasks. In today's motion, I'd like council to ask, uh, ask them to come back with a prioritized list. Susan Butler Graham. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for looking at this issue. Mothers Out Front urges you to protect our climate and cool our city by voting no on this plan, which is more of a preliminary study. Until significant corrections and changes are made, and there's a clear path forward for the city to partner with key stakeholders. Why are the trees disappearing? Where are funds for tree maintenance coming from? How do other cities with great urban forestry plans manage their trees? Who will coordinate tree planning, planting, maintenance, and enforcement between all the different departments? We can't keep planting trees without a plan to care for them because residents will be burdened with the cost of maintenance or the, or the risk from unhealthy trees, the trees won't survive, and the city won't reach its canopy goal. Equity must be centered in this plan so we can focus reforestation in the districts with the least amount of tree canopy. We need a coordinated plan for our urban forest integrated into the climate. Nick Kawada. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nick Kawada. I am the policy director for SPCN. Um, and much like the speakers who have uh, spoken before me, uh, we are also in support of the memorandum uh, issued by uh, the, the mayor, uh, council members Carrasco, Davis, Esparza, and Cohen. Uh, thank you so much for focusing uh, your efforts on experts in the field, substantive experts like our city forest, um, who are trying to address yeah. issues that um, definitely have equity uh, aspects to it. As we know, uh, climate change has disproportionately affected those uh, people of color on the east side, uh, and we need to address this as possible. So uh, thank you again for including the nonprofits. We uh, stand ready and ready and, and willing to uh, service the community the best we can. Thank you. Stephanie Morris. Yes, hi, I'm with Mothers Out Front Silicon Valley and I'm also a landscape architect. This report is, fo is focused primarily on city land or rights of way and about, that's about 15% of the tree canopy. Without stopping the destruction of mature trees on the 85% of the rest of the land, we will never recover, let alone grow our urban forest. Nutrient tree planting is simply not enough since it takes decades to form a tree canopy. Tree protection and enforcement is the biggest challenge for our urban forest. The city departments such as the transportation, planning, building, and code enforcement, parks and police departments need resources and coordination. Laws need to be clarified, enforcement consolidated, and funds allocated. City leadership needs to establish a tree commission within this calendar year as part of tree accountability. Our city forests simply cannot protect the city's mature trees. The city needs to do that. Please establish a tree commission with an eye toward equity, funding for mature trees, and priority for native trees such as oaks for their critical habitat. Victoria Moore. Hi, my name is Vicki Moore. Thank you. One of the many deficiencies in this report is the false implication 
that the city has never provided tree maintenance or sidewalk repair. It has done both at times in the past. The city provided regular street tree pruning until 2008. The entire city was set up in tree maintenance zones on a 10 year cycle, and that was improved every seven years just before the program was put on hold. Before adopting a tree management plan, and this draft is in no way a plan, let's find out how the city did this before, what lessons were learned, and then figure out how to resume street tree pruning. Stopping it has affected people's willingness to plant trees. Reviving it is a concrete way to show that the city values trees. This is another of many examples of a lack of baseline data in this report. There's no history, no context. The new plan has to be informed by past experience. Thank you very much. Suzanne Raymond. Suzanne? Okay, I'm gonna move on to Barbara Marshman. Thank you. I'm Barbara Marshman. I live in Willow Glen, and I know many of you from my former life as editorial page editor of the Mercury News. I want to thank Mayor Licardo and the council members who've submitted memos on, on this plan, especially yesterday's memo calling for the city auditor to figure out what money is or isn't coming into the city for trees and how it is spent. And I have to thank former Councilman David Pandori for his letter, which is attached to the agenda, which I hope you've all read, outlining his own investigation of what's happening to tree dollars and enforcement. It's pretty scary. I'm really surprised that you're still looking at adopting this report as a draft plan with so much missing or misleading information involving not only finances, but causes. And as much as we need more money for our urban forest, I think you need to first understand what's happened with Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, it's mid-February and we just have a lot of public comment today. Thanks. Um, uh, it's an interesting report. Uh, I'm, it didn't seem to have any planning for uh, the next few years. What can we expect? in 2023 and 24 compared to 2025. I hope we can start to uh, make some honest open plans about those sort of issues uh, in San Jose and, and that we can be clear what we can start to be expecting in 2023 and in 24. So good luck on how uh, we can talk about uh, such issues. Um, the California Office of Emergency Service was, Services was a, a big part of this process. Uh, can they be spoken about as well and what was their contribution and how we can talk about uh, future planning issues at this time. Thank you. Linda Ruthruff. Hi, Linda Ruthruff, California Native Plant Society. We are in a worldwide biodiversity crisis. Plants, birds, and animals are teetering on the brink of extinction. Our community forest can and should be part of the solution. It should encourage the planting of native trees, trees that support birds, butterflies, insects, and other creatures. It should especially encourage planting the greatest habitat heroes, our native oaks. We wrote four comment letters about this plan asking for specific easy changes that would support biodiversity. We had a meeting with the city arborist. None of our suggestions were incorporated. The San Jose General Plan has specific requirements to plant more native trees and especially native oaks. Please do not approve this plan until it is in compliance with the San Jose General Plan and incorporates the feedback of the many stakeholders who wish to be involved. Christina Egan. Christina Egan. Mute. I'm sorry. My name is Christina Egan. I'm on the board of Our City Forest. Honorable Mayor and City Council, thank you for listening to us tonight. We appreciate your acknowledgement of OCF as a key partner, but we ask that you do not adopt this draft plan. OCF's previous comments seem to be ignored 
and the inaccurate information has been unfair and damaging to the organization's reputation. Rather than reinvent the work of OCF within City Hall, we ask that you consider costs. OCF has saved the city tens of millions by leveraging outside funding, but we need more city support. Our AmeriCorps members train and develop projects for Resilience Corps, members who make two and a half times more money. Your investment in OCF helps 100% of the urban forest, not just the 15% under your purview. Call in user two. All these ideas are great, aren't they always? They need money. And the trees that the city usually wants you to plant aren't any good. They either, they either have these really bad things that fall off of them, you know, spiky balls or bad fruit you can't eat. They lift up the sidewalks. They have to be maintained. Since when is it you to dictate where I plant a tree anyway? It's ridiculous the things that you people come up with when there's potholes, there was just an armed robbery at a house in my neighborhood the other day, and you're worried about a tree canopy. You guys have a lot more to worry about. There's stolen cars. You know how many stolen cars have just happened in the last week? Hundreds. But we need a tree canopy. Is that going to get rid of the crime? Is that going to get rid of the, the raised up sidewalks? No, it's only going to make it worse. I don't think you realize what kind of maintenance. Carol Watts. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Carol Watts, president of the League of Women Voters of San Jose, Santa Clara. We urge you to pass the resolution approving this plan, including the memorandum by Mayor Licardo and council members Carrasco, Davis, Esparza, and Cohen as a start toward a healthier city. We agree with the formation of an advisory group, which should include representation from varied groups and experts in best practices for maintaining a healthy community forest. We're particularly pleased to see that the two to 5,000 trees to be planted annually will be distributed prioritizing underserved communities. And we applaud your effort to minimize impacts to the general fund by leveraging groups such as our city forest. For improvements, we recommend do not lose tree canopy when development occurs. Provide the public with frequent reports on progress and actions. Thank you very much. Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. I actually um, want to echo a little bit about what the last caller just said briefly. As far as developers go, I believe we're losing our trees, literally just one tree at a time, in addition to losing quite a few trees when we have these big development projects. For example, along Winchester in the uh, urban village there, when Graystar uh, you know, had to cut down all of those huge magnolia trees. And no matter what I said about it, it wouldn't matter. That huge six foot building was gonna go up and all those trees were gonna come down. And so I'm so grateful that the report discussed how important those large trees are. Because if we're going to get serious about tr saving our tree canopy, we actually need to focus on those really big trees that are hard to replace. And we should ask developers to please try to preserve um, any large trees on developments, if at all possible. Thank you. Kristen Lee. Kristen Lee. Hello, Honorable Council and Mayor, and Honorable Mayor. I'm representing the Forest Protection Committee of the Loma Prieta Chapter of the Sierra Club. We urge the city of San Jose to do more to protect mature trees and to plant locally native trees. As you know, mature trees store and absorb more carbon than young trees, and they do more to offset the harmful effects of pollution and greenhouse gases. The city of San Jose should require a detailed analysis of which mature trees have disappeared and why. It should also commit to creating an ongoing method to expose and reduce future mature tree removals based on that analysis. The CFMP should also include specific actions or requirements to support the planting and maintenance of local native trees in line with the letter from the California Plant Society. 
Finally, it will be very helpful to owners to receive proactive ed education on how to maintain trees. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I look through this document, remember, get it, remember some. I read every single document you guys produce, every single one of them. And I agree with 100% with what Joe Borders was saying about having some respect for the trees that have been planted here. Do you know that we can only survive four minutes without oxygen, but that tree can survive without us? That tree doesn't need us. We need that tree through the process, the beautiful process of photosynthesis. That tree breathes out. The minute I walk out a door, I have a relationship with the tree. How? Because it needs carbon dioxide to process photosynthesis so it spits back out into the atmosphere. Ta-da! Oxygen. This is basic. This is, these are basic Native American teachings to show you that you have a relationship with the environment that you're in. But what happened was Manifest Destiny came over here and just decimated everything. Suzanne Raymond. Suzanne, you need to unmute. Ah, there we go. I'm sorry. I'm also representing the Forest Protection Committee of the Loma Prieta chapter of the Sierra Club. My background includes being on the California Urban Forestry Council Advisory Committee, which is, advises the director of the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, CAL FIRE, on the state's urban forestry program and as an arborist for Valley Water for over five years. The Sierra Clubs, there are some finds, there are some major omissions in this plan. If you're going to solve a problem such as the decline in tree canopy in San Jose, you need to know the reasons why the decline is happening. Arborist Russell Hassan has pointed out some of these issues. It was 2008 when residents were informed that they were responsible for their street trees. It's obvious this decision has caused a great loss of canopy. If you look at the city of San Francisco and their Proposition A, it created a, a process. David Pandori. Good evening, uh, council members. I know it's been a long day, so I'll keep it short. I did send you an email. I hope you had a chance to read it. I, I, it shows some specific issues in the North San Pedro neighborhood, and I've asked for some specific recommendations to be included among all the other recommendations you're looking at tonight. I think these are important to take a look at because what's missing from this humongous report that you've been submitted, that's been submitted to you is, how have we lost these trees? And in this case, in our neighborhood, the city didn't follow through on, on an adopted plan for street trees. It didn't enforce um, tree mitigation requirements for a huge private development and it hasn't replaced mitigation for lost trees. So um, it's important to make gains in every neighborhood and this is an important one too. Thank you. Back to the council. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all the members of the community who came to speak. Uh, I wanna thank uh, DOT staff uh, and everybody's been working together on this, not just DOT, but a classic organization, um, as well as CAL FIRE for sponsoring the work and uh, uh, many community organizations, of course, starting with our city forest and, and the whole constituent tree coalition, Vicki Moore and Marta Berry and Linda Lazat and Barb Marshman, um, and all the many nonprofits that have engaged with us now, Save the Bay, Open Space Authority, OCF, uh, well, I mentioned them just a minute ago. Uh, also, since David Pandora just spoke, I want to thank him for his email, which I think has spurred some important conversations as well. Um, I... <clears throat> I know there have been several memoranda that have been submitted. Uh, we'll, uh, I think I'll, I'll refrain from uh, making any specific comments. I know we've got a lot to talk about. Councilmember Carrasco, I think you had a bit of a presentation. Is that right? Uh, yes, Mayor. If I, I think, I don't know if it's going to be Henry or. Uh, Tony's got it. Tony. Tony, do you have that? And I'm going to zip right through it because some of it has been covered uh, uh, from staff's presentation, but. I think uh, pictures are worth a million words. And so I really wanted to make sure that uh, we looked at some of the things that I've been talking about over the last uh, year or so. 
And I know some of the other council just, members. Just one moment, me. council member. Uh, Tony, do you have that, the screen share? Just give me a second. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, council member. And I know some of the other council members have also talked about greening and, uh, and the canopy in one way or the other. This is of particular importance to me because of, uh, of what I'm experiencing with my own residents and my family members on the east side of San Jose. So as we're talking about this policy uh, and we're talking about moving forward, uh, keeping in mind uh, really that uh, equity lens or that lens of equity, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's critical how we move forward, uh, how we plant our trees, how we remove pavement, how we maintain trees. I mean, uh, the entire city is, uh, is incredibly important, but uh, we'll see here as soon as Tony. Uh, I'm ready. Tony, you're running I out just... my clock. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I didn't want to um, interrupt no, you. Put it up, put it up, put it up, put it up. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Uh, I want to draw your attention, uh, and, uh, and Russ so, or someone went through these very quickly, but if you look at these, we went ahead and put them uh, in order, and this is the, the tree canopy that we're experiencing in the districts, and as you see, uh, as we go through the different districts, uh, you go from the least to the most uh, we don't have a lot of canopy anyway throughout the city, but uh, here is uh, our, our lowest. Let me remove my face from this so that I can see my own numbers. Just a second. Uh, and of course, uh, the those uh, districts that suffer the least are between uh, 10 and 12 percent. And those who have the highest, it's not very high either, but it's between 14 and 19 percent. Uh, so this gives you a little bit of a visual. Uh, you know, I'd love to understand why District 4 has such a low canopy uh, uh, and uh, District 7, of course, uh, besides having such a, 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 a small percentage in its canopy, has all of the other issues that we've been talking about during COVID. You know, it's an underinvested uh, district. It's a district that was hit very hard during uh, uh, COVID, uh, very densely populated district, District 5 as well, District 3 as well. Next slide, please. Um, is it Tony? Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to break down, uh, I wanted you to look at uh, those census tracts that are most impacted. And these are the 10 most economically disadvantaged uh, census tracts. And, uh, and this is what's most alarming. There's a couple here that are, are outliers. And if you look at the most disadvantaged uh, census tracts, you'll see an outlier here. You'll see actually two outliers. There's a 52.6% um, uh, I mean, that uh, correlates with the 22.22% and right underneath it, it's 19.05%. Please don't be fooled by that uh, because that actually takes into account uh, tree, uh, parks that are nearby, which I think is a real, it's really misleading and it really skews the our numbers but of those very impoverished census tracts those are taking into account um uh, nearby uh parks so the 22.22 percent uh takes into account coyote creek and william street park 19.05 uh, is happy hollow park um and uh Kelly Park and History Park. And then the 17.26%, which is at the very bottom, is Bequesto and Watson Park. And then if you go into the greener columns, those two at the very top also uh, have uh, uh, the Los Gatos Creek and the Los Gatos Memorial Park. So those outliers uh, take into account uh, the parks that are nearby. But nonetheless, even if you were to remove those, uh, you still have in the more affluent areas a higher canopy versus those neighborhoods that uh, are economically disadvantaged have a um, suffer from less canopy. Next, uh, next uh, slide, please. So what is an urban heat island in San Jose? Well, uh, an urban heat island, an urban heat island is, uh, is an area where structures such as buildings, roads, and other infrastructure absorb and re-emit the sun's heat 
more than natural landscapes, such as forests or a nice little canopy or where there's greenery, urban areas where the greenery is limited, it becomes an island of higher temperatures relative to outlying areas. These pockets of heat are referred to as heat islands. And on the east side of San Jose, we'll see in a little bit uh, that we suffer from a heat island. We tend to have our, our, our hot temperatures tend to be hotter than the rest of the city of San Jose. Next, uh, next uh, slide, please, Tony. So how do uh, urban heat islands affect uh, our residents and how does it affect their health? Well, um, rising temperatures obviously uh, have a, a greater impact on people's quality of life. Uh, of course, the most vulnerable of our residents are the most impacted, that's children, seniors, those with pre-existing conditions. Between 2010 and 2019, the hottest decade on record, uh, California's official data from death certificates attributed 599 deaths to heat exposure. Uh, when you add more trees or when you have a greater canopy, uh, tree shade reduces UV be exposure by about 50%, which in turn reduces residents' chance uh, to develop skin cancer. Of course, you know my history. My mother passed of skin cancer, and so this is near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and uh, I always talk about it every chance that I get. Trees have a significant effect on improving residents' respiratory health. Uh, and I will tell you that one of the most alarming things that I heard when I first came into council was of a mother who approached me and said to me that uh, her child who suffers from asthma uh, was kept home during those very, very hot days because the school on the east side of San Jose didn't have air conditioning. And so it was very bad for her child's uh, asthma. He would have asthma attacks. So at least one week during very hot weather, she would keep him home. The rest of the days when it was very hot, she would take her own fan to help him uh, in order not to have those asthma attacks. Uh, by the way, this also happened when it got very, very, very cold. Uh, if, uh, if it dipped, she would actually uh, take him home because uh, uh, the uh, lack of also canopy uh, um, impacted the weather conditions in the winter. So exercising in a canopy area has been shown to reduce blood pressure and stress-related hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline. But of course, uh, in good conscience, I will tell you colleagues, I have a very hard time telling my families to go out and exercise out in the sun for the same reasons that I've, uh, I've expressed in the past. Next, um, next slide, please. I wanted to show you this because this is my reality and this is the reality of my children. This is the reality of my residents. This is one of the many streets in my district on your right-hand side. That's La Porta Avenue. Uh, that is not an unusual street. This is very, very typical of the blocks in my district. If you haven't come out to District 5, I invite you to come out and take a stroll with me. Uh, Summers are wonderful to come and hang out. This uh, on the left-hand side, you're probably familiar with it, uh, Vice Mayor, is a, a street in, uh, in your district. Next slide. Here's another, uh, another block. Um, I know it well. Uh, this is Balboa. And this is in the Plata Arroyo. Very, uh, it's a historic, uh, uh, community. Uh, we have a skate uh, park there. A lot of kiddos hang out there, especially a lot of teenagers. Uh, it's, uh, it, it borders actually uh, council member paralysis district. It's, uh, it's part of um, Little Portugal. But this is common. This is, this is my district. And you could see why we don't jog in the middle of the day. We don't even jog at four o'clock in the afternoon. We wait until it's either very, very late, very, very early, or we don't jog at all. So what does that do to our health? And check out uh, what's going on on Harrison Street. Next, next slide. So
So I'm almost done. And here's a little bit of the same. Next slide. Um, a study was done by San Jose State University Human Rights Institute, which found that 5.2 degree, there was a 5.2 degrees difference in Fahrenheit. Uh, the average temperature between Rose Garden and Alum Rock neighborhood. In this picture, we can see clearly the difference in the canopy. Next slide. Although only six miles apart, Rose Garden is predominantly white and wealthy, has three and a half times more tree coverage and 27% less pavement in comparison to the Alum Rock neighborhood, predominantly a working class neighborhood and a neighborhood that is predominantly people of color. Next slide. Over the last six years, the east side has lost 3.17% of its canopy cover, going from close to 16% in 2012 to about 12% now. I, uh, I had 250 trees approved last at last year's budget uh, cycle. It's been a little frustrating trying to figure out where to plant them, uh, how to plant them, when to plant them. Uh, and partly because we're paved over. And Russ has been wonderful. His team's been wonderful uh, working with DLT. It's not staff's fault. We under, uh, under invested neighborhoods are completely paved over. We've got to start looking at our policies that, uh, that prevent us from doing exactly what we want to do which is increase our canopy. And, uh, and we have to start thinking outside of the box. And one of the things that, uh, that Portland has done is uh, they have a pavement removal program that, uh, that allows them to do exactly this, remove the pavement and plant thousands of trees. If you look at uh, the right-hand side, that's my district. <laughs> really? I love it. Okay, so I think it's the last slide. Because we're cross I think we're getting toward the end here. Yeah, last slide. So this is an opportunity that we have here to create pocket forests. And pocket forests, of course, is uh, is taking a little tiny piece of land and, and creating your own uh, micro uh, uh, forest, a pocket forest, they call it, uh, which is uh, greenery and shrubbery and uh, really changing uh, the microclimate of a tiny little area, but really does make a, a huge difference. So at, at this point, it's using every tool that we have in our toolbox, um, uh, addressing policies, looking at finance structures, and, uh, and as some of the uh, callers uh, uh, mentioned, is uh, really looking to see how we, uh, how we bring in different stakeholders and making sure that we hold each other accountable. Uh, Councilman Kraska, I think we just lost you. If you're trying to speak, you're she muted. Oh, she just lost her signal. She's on. Okay, I think she just lost a connection. So why don't we do this? Why don't we go to Council Member Mayhan while she comes back, and then uh, when Council Member Mayhan's down, we'll come back. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll just start by quickly thanking everyone who put together the report that we're receiving here. Um, and thank you to thank you to Cal Fire in particular for the funding, uh, DOT, all the other departments that collaborated, our city forest, and, and the many, many stakeholders who sent in letters and, and otherwise participated in the process. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, thank you. To, I also want to thank Councilor Carrasco for the follow-up presentation and reinforcing the point that we don't have equitable access. I think we are all tree deficient, but certainly and predictably parts of our city are more tree deficient than others. And having taught middle school on East uh, Side and, and specifically District 5 and having coached soccer in the summers in District 5, I have not only seen, but felt that um, that disparity there. So I, I appreciate the point and very much know it to be true. 
Um, I, I wanted to, I had a series of hopefully relatively quick questions. Um, John, or, or maybe it's better for Russell or Ryan, what I was unable to, to get this out of your report. What, what is our leading, what is your leading hypothesis for the biggest driver of canopy loss? I, and I'll just say, I would have guessed development, but I noticed that District 10, which I represent, actually had the largest percentage decline over the period studied. And I believe is that significantly less development than, than many other parts of the city. So what, what is, what's our current state of understanding on that yeah. question? Council member John Russo, director of transportation. Yeah. And I think Russ and Ryan are actually teed up to respond to that. Okay. Yeah, I'd be glad to help answer that. Um, it's, it's very difficult given the existing data to pinpoint precisely one root cause of, one leading cause of tree decline across the city. Um, you, you, there, are, there is information available for when trees would be removed um, from for a development project, uh, but then there's also instances where a tree is requested for removal because it's dead. And in those instances, it's not necessarily listed that the tree died because of drought or a pest or disease or you know some other factor. Um, so to to differentiate within spe the specifics of individual trees, it's very difficult without having more uh, clear data as to the root causes of those issues. But I think it's definitely something like moving forward um, that could be implemented in within the reporting and data gathering so the city can help point more specific. Yeah, right. So another hypothesis, I mean, one would be that development removes larger trees and then we, we replace them with, with young trees that take 30 years to grow. Uh, another, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. I'm sure there are many causes, but uh, you just pointed to the, the uh, trees dying. Do we, did we, do we know of any patterns to that by any chance? I mean, our, a hypothesis might be that street trees where it's not, you know, somebody might not even realize it's their responsibility or they may be harder to maintain. Do we see higher failure rates in any particular locations or based on who owns, who's responsible for the tree? Um, we didn't, or we weren't able to analyze like specifics of who, uh, who would be managing the tree that would, would be removed, whether it's private, pri public or private property. Um, we have the, the data that shows where the specific um, canopy cover changes have occurred. Um, so some further analysis could be done um, by extrapolating property lines. It wouldn't be 100% accurate because canopy covers would cross over between public and private space, um, but you could be able to help differentiate that a little bit more clearly. Okay. And then kind of a related question, I, you know, I thought um, the mayor's and, and, and council colleagues group memo made made some excellent points, including the, just the basic resource constraints that we face. Where, you know, it seems to me we're unlikely to, in any short time frame, find $16 million to suddenly do you know, what we would ideally do. Can we talk a little more about ROI and where you see the biggest opportunity? If, if we said, what could you do with a million extra million dollars a year? Where would it where would it be? And and one, you know, just again to throw out a, a hypothesis that could be totally off base. Given the difficulty of coordinating with a with a counterparty here, say, say a resident who may not be up to the the cost of installing, maintaining the tree, is there more low hanging fruit in on public lands and maybe even other agencies that have a lot of land within the city, water districts, school districts? Did, is that a line of thinking you all went down very far? Yeah, um, uh, Councilor Director uh, John Rush again. Uh, we're actually looking at all those things. Is that now that we've uh, really teamed up with a, a number of partners? You heard some of them speak tonight. That we certainly want to investigate how we might be able to do uh, planting in areas that maybe we didn't have control. We don't have control over. Or we never maybe never thought of before. So that's definitely something to to think about. I think in terms of some of the, the other questions you had were low hanging fruit. Well, we know we've got to do some organization changes, and that's not a not necessarily a big 
dollar item, but it is an organizational change we're going to need to go through to just be better managed. And then I think also we also recognize we've got to stop or slow down the loss, and that's going to be multiple areas of work, whether it's developer or um, you know individual property owners, whether it's street tree public property or, or private property trees, just how many are being taken out either illegally or, or unnecessarily so. So there, I think those are some areas. Mm -hmm. If we do have funding, funding to do more planting, that's definitely what we want to do, but we don't want to plant them and not maintain them. Sure. Uh, well, if, I just that, if I can just add also, I think yeah. uh, Councilmember Carrasco brought up uh, and something we've really been advocating for within DOT also is this concept of pocket forests. I do think yeah. there's a lot of ROI uh, in that concept where you find a localized area that is probably not a street, you know, and it's probably not too difficult to access where many trees, I'm sorry, I have two kids downstairs, um, where many, many trees could be planted at once to kind of provide a lot of the benefits that Councilmember Carrasco laid out. So I think that's one immediate area. And again, um, just kind of getting a handle on our, our city trees, you know, whether they're in parks or uh, city medians and stuff like that. I think we've mentioned there are some areas that can be maintained. I think setting an example for the city would be a good place to start and kind of scaling out any future program. But uh, ultimately, I, I do think a quick win, you know, a good idea is those pocket forests. I think that's a great way to get started. Yeah, I, I find that idea compelling. Thanks, Rick. And I, um, I, I guess I'm Partly reflecting, you know, the, the co comment I heard from a few folks in public comment about this feeling more like a report than a plan and just in the spirit of and I think again my colleagues memo basically points in this direction as well just you know what what is how do we hone in on the highest ROI investments or, or changes that we might be able to make. Um, I know it's getting late I'm going to try to move quickly here a couple more. Um, I was, this, this came up, Mayor referenced it. I, I was um, interested and in, in pretty dismayed by the letter submitted by Mr. Pandori. And, and I, I don't know if we're able to get any greater clarity in this meeting, or the, I know there was a supplemental memo that, that may get at this over time, but you know, the, he identified three examples that were concerning. Do we think this is a, a widespread uh, occurrence? Is this something that just needs more study? What, are, are you able to add anything at this point? Yeah, uh, I'll turn that. It's really uh, uh, Matt Kano is probably better able to right. answer that question than I am. Sure. 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 Thank you, Councilmember Matt Kano, Public Works Director. Um, thank you for the question, and and um, you know, it's it's a combination of things for this one. Um, you know, and and it probably does require further study to 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 be the quick answer. And I know there's a recommendation to work with the city auditor to look into this, and we're de we're definitely welcome that recommendation if it's accepted tonight. I'm just a quick example on like the San Pedro development. Typically for new developments like that on the big San Pedro area, we do have conceptual plans. There isn't necessary, but a lot, sometimes a lot of the, a decent amount of trees aren't necessarily able to be installed because of utility conflicts and driveway conflicts and other things like that. And there isn't, and then never, to, to my knowledge, there hasn't really been a loop back process to tell everybody, oh, we planned X trees and X trees um, weren't installed. Um, and a lot of that isn't necessarily a mitigation or a formal a requirement. Um, and so that is a process um, that we'll continue to take a look at as we move forward. And I can provide some other thoughts on that if you'd like as well. Okay, great. I mean, presumably in those situations, we could be asking developers to help us fund investments in other parts of the city where we could, we could kind of concentrate our resources, those pocket parks, for example, is that part of your thought process? Yeah, and and uh, silver the the one specific question on a specific development as well. Um, we we also recognize, as was in that email, that there is a gap, uh, likely a gap between what was required for mitigation efforts on that specific development and what what was installed. And we're working, planning, building code enforcement, and others are looking into what that gap is, and uh, it may end up into us collecting mitigation fees that then could be used for other tree for more tree development elsewhere. Great, and I, I recognize I'm at time, so out of respect, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause. I, I did uh, want at some point we can do it offline. Talk about native trees as part of the plan, and then how do we move from this being more of a comprehensive report? Very, I mean, great data. Appreciated the charts and graphs, but also to more of a strategic plan that kind of fits our resource constraints. Which again, I think is the spirit of my colleague's memo. So I'll leave it at that, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilor. Councilor Carrasco, if you could very briefly uh, wrap up, because I know we've got other folks in the queue. <laughs> Thank you. I ran cool. out of juice. 
<laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm all done, Mayor. I just wanted to make a motion to accept, uh, to move uh, our our memo along with the supplemental and council member Mayhan's uh, memo as well. Second. Right, thank you, cast member. Uh, thank you both. Uh, let me just say a quick word about whether we adopt the plan or not. Obviously, the recommendations we adopt it. I, I know several advocates have urged that we decline to adopt the plan. And I think you could tell from the text of the memorandum that several of us co-authored, um, we all have some pretty significant concerns about whether or not we really have a plan. Um, I don't think we have a plan. I, I think we have maybe the start of a plan. But we've got a lot more work to do to really understand how do we find resources and how do we most cost effectively invest those resources to actually get what we all want, which is uh, more beautiful trees and a great urban forest. So. What I've been told is that if we don't adopt the plan of some kind, we have a hard time getting any grant money. Uh, is 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 that uh, accurate? I think that came from you, Rob. <laughs> is, that, is that a fair statement, or John? We, well, yeah, we we believe this is a, a good plan with a with a strategic list of a actions that we want to take. Some near term, some longer term, and some very dependent on resources. We know that and uh, seeking resources is going to be a big deal, but we are recommending to adopt the plan to your question. Yeah, well, you know, I think it would be on that. I just want to understand. Damaging to yeah. our future ability to work with Cal Fire if we use their funding to do a plan and then it is not adopted by the council. That's, I guess, my answer to that. John, can I also sure. add a little something? You know, I, th I think we have attachment B as, as the strategic work plan, and that's why we had a slide in the presentation called the roadmap, which really does highlight some of the higher level objectives. And, and truthfully, we do believe that engagement with the community is important, and the establishment of this committee will really guide the implementation of that strategic work plan. We didn't want to be too prescriptive, you know, because we know that uh, council makes policy ultimately, and we needed to kind of lay out recommendations to move ahead and the things we know we needed to, excuse me, accomplish. Um, and I think it's also important to note, you know, working closely with the Cal Fire Urban Forest or the sponsors of this grant, uh, the very clear that this is the, the largest uh, step any city has taken on a similar plan from where we are to where we need to go. Uh, so okay. I, think, I think you said it right, Mayor, it is, it is the first step, but it is a, I think it is a first step on a very long path, but it is a roadmap and it gives staff and the community guidance as far as what to focus on in the coming years. Okay, I, I appreciate staff's uh, insistence that this really is a plan. I, I, I still struggle to find uh, what is he in here that is going to tell us where we are going to maximize our investment, where we're going to find significant ongoing resources. I, I, I don't see that. But anyway, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And, and I don't think it's worth the semantic argument over whether what's the plan and what's the report. Yeah. I consider a lot of it to be a report and a useful report because it gives us a lot of the data that we need to figure out where we need where we have gaps and what we have to do address and i think that that we the mayor that the, the memo that we worked on um you know looks at some of those gaps and, and thinks about ways we can address them and i think there's there's a there's a five major areas that i see in terms of the tree loss tree maintenance um urban greening and 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 uh the audits of all those, all those pieces are the five major issues that I think need to be addressed, and I'm glad that we've addressed all those in, in the memos. Um, I have a few. First, I'm going I'm to comment about District 4. Um, it was obviously, I think, surprising to all of us to find out that District 4 had the lowest tree cover in the city, but actually, it's not as surprising as you think if you drive around North San Jose. So I'll just point out that there's two parts of District 4, and, and parts of it have a good tree cover, but really, North San Jose is, is, is a wasteland as far as trees. Except for River Oaks, which is a nice little pocket, um, the rest of North San Jose is pretty devoid, and and that would point to to potentially development as the culprit in that part of the city, not in other parts of the city. Um, and that's why we've been talking with our business partners up there, our high tech companies, about this problem, and have alerted them just recently. And many of them are now stepping forward and saying they're they're willing to fund and help us maybe do some tree plantings on their campuses and in that part of the city. And so that's actually really exciting. We're going to start working with them because a lot of it's these tech buildings and tech campuses that are big parking lots with very little tree cover, and we need to fix that problem. And we're excited that Google's campus in Alviso, which is a old Cisco buildings with big parking lots, before they open, they're 
ripping out parking lots to put in um, tree, put back the trees because that's important to them as a company. But we need to encourage that more in our future development. So um, <clears throat> this is the kind of thing we have to be looking at across our city. Um, I want to thank uh, commenter Victoria Moore, who brought up the comment about how the city used to maintain street trees. Um, and I do have a question. I don't know who might know the answer about the, the history of, and I think I've asked this before in other private meetings, but what is the history over, over that transition from the city maintaining street trees to relying on residents for um, the street tree maintenance? Maybe I can help. Uh, I've been around for a while and used to be the budget director, um, Jennifer McGuire, city manager. The, uh, for a long period of time, we did not fund those um, for the sidewalk repair and, and, the, and the tree trimming. And then there was a period, I believe it was during Mayor Gonzalez's years, where we did actually fund, the, fund that for a period of years with trying to make our, our uh, city more walkable. We had a lot of sidewalk problems and, and, and also tree care. Ultimately, the sidewalks and the tr trees are in our, I think it's in our municipal code, our responsibility of the homeowner. And when budget times got really bad and we went through, you know, you know, years and years and years of budget cutting, we once again cut that out of the budget and it's never been restored. Yeah, so this is this point. It wasn't that, restored for that. I mean, it wasn't when under Mayor Gonzalez, it wasn't around that long uh, that that the homeowners got to benefit from that. Right, right. And if I could also so, add the the, uh, the tree crews in, in particular, I think that I saw that comment brought up a few times. Um, and Russ, in fact, I don't believe any of our staff were here back when that occurred, but um, the tree crews, there was no 10 year cycle. There was no, um, you know, prescriptive or predictable uh, method of maintenance. It really was to clear street lights uh, for paving, things like that. So it was really a supplement, um, the resident responsibility for the overall maintenance of the trees. It was well, never also, really intending to take away that responsibility from the resident. As far as I know, we also contracted to a third party who did our street tree maintenance. Um, in fact, I learned that last year at the Cal Cities conference when I was talking to some of these companies and one of them asked about San Jose and I said, you know, we don't, we don't maintain trees. And they said, well, you used to, because we used to have the contract. Um, <laughs> so it, it, this is one of those cases where sometimes I think we make short-sighted decisions on what we think are less important only to be paying the price many years later for mistakes that we make. Um, I, you know, an example, when I was on the school board, we were fixing replacing all of our fields because back in the in the in the down budget years a past administration decided to stop watering fields to save money well the result is that you end up spending millions of dollars later to replace all your fields um, i suspect that a large part of our loss in certain parts of the city is residential tree loss um, people who take out trees who don't replace them there's probably two reasons for that one is this issue of maintenance problems the other is that i'm not sure whether we have much enforcement of the rules about when you take out a tree, you got to replace it. So um, I do want to see in that item on our motion about the audit that we are looking at that question about how we're um, monitoring and, and promoting and continuing to make sure that our residential tree loss or trees are replaced and that people are, are getting permits for tree removal. I know my somebody, a neighbor on my street removed two trees just last month and I'm not sure that they, <laughs> they had a, a permit for that. Um, I don't think they replaced them. People just do that when they when they decide they don't want trees anymore or, or there's a something other, other work they're doing. Um, the other part with, about development though, I know we do have a policy about tree replacement for development where it's like a three to one tree replacement if you remove something. So um, hopefully we'll find out if we do some more auditing about how we're enforcing that. Is it actually happening? Are we checking up on it? Are we making sure that when people take out 20 trees, they put back 60 somewhere um, so that we make sure that we're not falling behind on, on that work. <clears throat> um, my last question is, or it's not really, it's more of a, of a philosophical question about what's the right place in the city for, the, for this tree function to be? And this isn't an indictment of DOT and all the great work that DOT does, but whether there's a <clears throat> mission conflict or a, question of what's the right mission for the right department as far as um, you know, the work that DOT is responsible for and versus where's the right, 
where how we would be focused on tree maintenance and, and tree um, planting. <clears throat> so it's just a kind of a question, a general question for the city to think about how do we what how do we do this in, a, in, a, in the right way? Um, <clears throat> and obviously, I appreciate the comments from Councilmember Frasco and others who have talked about concrete removal. Um, you know, a great example from Portland that I, that Councilmember Frasco showed. Um, how do we how do we incorporate that kind of work into the work we do as we do our pavement projects? So we're doing things all at the same time. It's interesting, you know, even even forgetting about not just trees but the green strips that you could have between a bike lane and the road. You know, we're going in and we're putting in bike lanes, but because we're replacing pavement, we have a paved white strip that's just a paved strip. Ideally, we would be using that opportunity to get some greenery back in those strips since we're not gonna be using them for driving or biking and they're just a buffer. But again, these are all expensive things to do and just questions about how we really think about this moving forward. Um, so I think that's most of the points I wanted to make. I'm, I'm appreciative of all of the, the uh, <clears throat> studies that were done and then all the work that my colleagues and, and the council have done to try to address this issue. I know this is something that we're universally behind and I'll wanna see improved. Uh, Councilman Jimenez. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to be too long. Um, let me just first say that I appreciated uh, Council Member Cohen, Cohen's comments about where this uh, issue should reside. I had one of the, some of the similar question, right? Uh, and it's not one that I expect to be answered today, but uh, just really whether this function is the, it, you know, if it resides within DOT, if it's the mo most appropriate location. Um, so that's one, one of the things I wanted to say. Uh, the other thing is, it seems to me that this just comes down to two very basic issues, and one is how do we reduce or stop the re reduce or stop or, or just reduce the removal of these trees, and the other part is just simply how do we plant more. And and I think fundamentally those that's the way I see this issue, and, and I know there's challenges, even though it seems very simplistic. You know, e even the photo that was shown by Councilmember Carrasco, it reminds me. You know, I grew up in East San Jose, and I, I remember seeing neighborhoods like that as you know growing up and certainly it's not new to me but something that stood out to me in one of her photos i think it was one of the last photos she showed where um uh, she touched on the fact that there were over you know there were over they're over paved essentially and i think it showed maybe about two or three houses where there was just tons of concrete in front of the houses and so for me one of the things that that prompted for me is what i'm wondering is are, are there and I imagine, I'm not sure who to address this to or who to ask this of, but it seems to me that there may very well be certain city policies that help facilitate <laughs> the overpavement of some of these places, right? Uh, and, 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 and what comes to mind as well is that it may not be that straightforward because I suspect some of the pictures she showed, for example, may be folks that maybe are paving over the green space, taking out a tree because they're having parking issues, for example. <laughs> and they want more vehicles to fit on their driveway or or what I see quite often as well in my district as well. But I think more prominently in East San Jose is just there's a lot of folks running their businesses out of their homes. Right. And so they they naturally pave over some of their driveway and maybe take out their lawn and things of that nature, take out a tree. And so I just like to just plant that seed to, to, to figure out and, and really explore the idea if there are certain city policies that we really need to review. And, and modify in order to reduce the incentive for folks or, or maybe take away the ability for folks to really take out some of the green space that naturally resides in, on, their, on their property, their front lawn or taking out trees. And so that was one thing I wanted to share. Uh, the other thing that um, came to mind is I know a big function of trying to resolve this and fix this situation is money. Um, and, I, and, and this is one of those larger sort of existential questions that I'll, I'll put out there, uh, knowing that, you know, whether this is a report or a plan that whoever hears this can carry it forward and really explore it, and even the city manager, right? Because I really do think that this is, this is something that we should, as a city should think about. But, you know, sort of marrying the idea of the, the function that these trees present and the, that they serve in our community, right? Uh, creating shade taking out carbon, uh, reducing heat islands and things of that nature, it seems to me that they quite possibly could reside very well in climate smart San Jose. And, and I think that currently it doesn't reside, that, that that plan doesn't necessarily touch the urban forestry 
or, or trees generally. And so what I'm curious about is if someone has any thoughts or just uh, immediate sort of reactions to whether this issue, this idea, this challenge can reside in, in a space of that nature, and maybe that can help facilitate the application of grants and things of that nature, knowing that there's some money coming from the federal government as it relates to the environment and things of that nature. Is I don't know if that um, if there's anyone that wants to just touch on that. Uh, well, on yeah, Councilmember John Russo again, and yes, uh, although this is complementary to climate smart. <clears throat> Um, yeah, it's not, I don't believe that uh, it's calculated into the, the climate smart emissions. So there, there may be a little difference there, but working together with both the general plan and, and uh, our, our uh, climate smart plan, they're, they're all working in the right direction. And yes, we're going to be seeking all kinds of different ways to fund these activities that we're recommending to move forward whether they be coming out of a, you know, some sort of air quality or climate smart type of grant or a, more of a transportation related or other infrastructure or equity grant that's out there. So now that uh, a lot of different grantor agencies are kind of getting with the program on that, we're going to be aggressive in going after those. Well, well, I think if we as city leaders and as a city are saying that this is an issue that we want to tackle, right? And, and uh, I think it's worth having a discussion. Maybe, I don't know if Carrie's on the call, but even just because I think ESD uh, is the one that, you know, quite frankly, manages a lot of that climate smart San Jose stuff. But to the extent, um, you know, if we think this is important enough to lift up as one of those strategies that we're going to utilize to then move us forward to a more uh, resilient future as it relates to the environment, I think it's a worthwhile discussion to have. And so just wanted to say that uh, the other thing, uh, John, I would say or for you or Rick, but uh, what are your thoughts about this? This. Um, this comment or statement about uh, whether DOT is the best place for this to, to sort of reside? And that's a loaded <laughs> question. You don't have to tell me where you think it should go, but uh, let me know if you think that it, it, it's, it's the most appropriate place. As we pull out our crystal ball and we're gonna work through that, <laughs> that as one of the work programs. And so, no, we're, we're gonna try to find the best location or locations for the city's tree program. And I, I don't know that we figured that out yet, but. There's a lot of other examples out there of cities where we're going to use that. And we are going to be using, you know, um, the community force, you know, the advisory committee to actually help us through that as well. So we're going to be looking hard at it to see what's, where's the best landing spot for a tree program. Okay. All right. Uh, you, you know, I would just end with this is, is that, um, you, you know, and I don't say this lightly, but uh, I know and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn or saying something that folks don't generally understand to be true, because I think district too often is really a microcosm of the city. We get a little bit of everything. When we see some of these graphics, we often fall in the middle <laughs> uh, as it relates to you know, trees or accidents, whatever it may be. And so um, I, I wonder, and this is just to throw this out there, I don't need a response, but I also wonder how much, um, uh, how much really, how, how much of community involvement and engagement really impacts the growth and, and the proliferation of trees, right? So for example, um, I know that, you know, having started a neighborhood association in the past, it's very challenging to get people active. Uh, but when you look at parts of the city where folks are working two or three jobs, scraping by, trying to raise kids, uh, they don't always have time to be civically engaged. Um, but, and, and I know that that's a challenge that's very real that I think we need to think about as it relates to some of these disadvantaged parts of our city. And conversely, if you think about other parts, say District 10, because I know there's a lot of active folks out there, there's often folks that uh, there's very active neighborhood associations that are taking up the issue of planting trees and spending their Saturdays doing this and that, which I think is wonderful, right? I think it's what we all aspire for our residents, but I think just acknowledging that this lack of engagement may be contributing to some of this uh, lack of activity, right? And I know it's, uh, complicated thing where you know I, I suspect that's not the silver bullet but i think we just need to make sure that everything's in play as we're discussing this and, and for the city to do everything possible to try to address all these different little pockets of issues that that lead to what we see today so thank you thank you councilmember cross yeah thank you very much uh, and I just want to echo some of the comments that my colleagues have made. First off, thank you to staff on the uh, the, the report, and um, uh, I think I would I would agree that it is um, it is indeed 
uh, likely not a, 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 a full comprehensive plan that we would all want. It is likely more um, a very detailed analysis of where we're at. Um, and it is the beginning of a, of a plan. And I recognize there may be some difference of opinion from city staff there on um, what they've put together in regards to, to the plan. Um, but I, I know that this is a really, really good first look and analysis, deep analysis of uh, something that, that we all as a council have needed to, uh, to be educated on and our community as well. Um, and I do think it, it puts us down uh, the beginning of a great path to be able to actually um, understand how we will, will make change uh, and invest in addressing these concerns. It, it, I know that I was very uh, both impressed and depressed in looking over the, the plan um, and, and understanding much better where some of those challenges are and, and historically uh, and then both prospectively looking forward how we can make a difference. Um, I also, uh, just in regards to what council member Jimenez was just saying, I also uh, don't feel as though DOT, and no offense, uh, John, but I don't feel DOT is the best place to house this work. And, and maybe it, it doesn't belong in any current department. Maybe it's um, sort of got a need of its own. And I, I look to what we just did recently with addressing homelessness um, and how we understood that the, uh, the housing department may not be the best location uh, for that work and, and ultimately have shifted a lot of that work to the Beautify team. Um, and I think that was appropriate. And, and you look across other cities and look at the departments that they have, whether it's dealing with issues like homelessness, uh, and they have um, robust and, and unique departments to, to really focus on those efforts. I think similarly here, we, we have uh, something that we have, unfortunately, not invested in uh, at the, the level we should be, and we know that. Uh, and thus, it's, it's sort of tucked in and under the responsibility of a department that likely um, it, it shouldn't be a, a responsibility of. And I, I do think that that's something that hopefully as we talk to the uh, advisory group and, and, and understand um, how we can, can change and make better investment, that's something that will come out of that as well. Uh, lastly, I will say I, I, I've heard from both um, David Pandori as well as a number of other constituents over the last week in regards to the North San Pedro area uh, and the specific challenges that we have there. And, and I appreciate them uh, on overturning and, and, and really highlighting some of the potential challenges that we had there. Thank you, Matt, for responding to that today. I, I don't think it's appropriate to include uh, those individual um, trees in that individual area with an emotion here, but I will say that um, I have already reached out to um, our city staff to understand that particular area better and where we can, uh, if there were uh, deficiencies and, and where we can as a city be able to step in uh, and make right there in that area. Uh, so uh, I will be supporting the motion and, and, and again, appreciate all the work from our uh, my colleagues. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I want to offer one uh, suggestion as we're contemplating how we're going to actually pay for what we, uh, whatever we'd like to actually do. Um, in paragraph five, I, I suggest uh, we suggest that uh, the colleagues and I all co-sign this memo. Uh, exploring something that would be Prop 26 compliant. And I would just suggest perhaps as you're talking to the attorneys about that, um, that clearly what we would need to be able to do is accept liability, I would assume, for trees in addition to responsibility. In other words, not just the cost of pruning, but for every property owner to be actually be able to say they benefit, I'm guessing we'd probably need to do more than that. Um, and so I, I would just ask if we could explore that, uh, not simply assuming the cost, but also assuming the liability so that uh, I would hope that would be more likely to be Prop 26 compliant. I, I don't know if you have any view on that yet, nor if you would like to take time to, to study it. Um, we'll look at that, Mayor, but in terms of liability, do you mean for a sidewalk uplift? Do you mean for a a, a tree branch injury. Yeah, exactly. Type of thing. The tree branch falls on somebody, or if there's a, a sidewalk that lifts up because of a of a root, um, one way or another, if we're going to be able to demonstrate benefit to the property owner, I'm guessing probably means the city's going to have to take on something. Yeah, I'm I, I'm not sure that that's accurate, but we will definitely look at it. And and okay. as you know, we've we've. Uh, litigated a few years ago um, 
our sidewalk ordinance and um, it, it prevailed on that, but we will. Oh, I understand um, it, it's, yeah. it's upheld. I understand what we have yeah. is legal. The question is, <laughs> if we want somebody else to pay for it, we might have to think about changing the rule. <laughs> yeah. Something no, that we, yeah. I, I understand. Um, so we'll look at it and, okay. and uh, see what we might be able to pull together. Okay, great. Uh, and then I just want to ask staff, as you look at uh, direction number three in the original memo uh, about responding, I think these are questions that have been posed in the past. And I think we're trying to really understand, get our arms wrapped around them. I did see a slide about the cost of planting versus uh, and, and the cost of maintaining. That's an A, um, but it would be helpful to know if there are I, I don't know what cost exactly was. Um, let me go back to to the, the staff's uh, estimate. I think it was somewhere around uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the uh, two hundred fifty or so trees that were to be planted in San Jose. Uh, and I don't know if that estimate included uh, the cost of maintaining the trees, or that was simply the planting. That was all of the above. It was all of the above. Okay, so Rick, then the slide that you offered relating to the establishment of the tree, that is the explanation for why the, the cost got to $1,000 a tree. Correct. The, the planting is a small piece of it, and the three years of maintenance, including watering and pruning, uh, makes up the majority of the cost. Okay. Um, all right. I, I guess it, you know, perhaps another time I'd love to offline understand that a little better. Um, sure. Yeah, Dave, we are going to be going back to one of the committees. I can't remember which one, Neighborhood Services, I think. That's right. But yeah, we're, okay. in a couple of months, we're going to be there. And so we'll certainly be able to break that down further. But yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, um, the issue around waiving liability, if we're trying to encourage folks to accept trees, particularly in low-income neighborhoods, is that something we've explored? I know we talked about uh, ways to try to motivate um, John. I think it came up in a conversation we've had at council a couple of times. Yeah, I remember you asking this question more more than once, and um, it, it it may be the same type of question that Nora was trying to answer. We're going to look at it. You know, it, it's a matter of like uh, what's the practical and what's the financial liability that the city is going to take on if you want to if you want to take on those things. And I and I think that is something that as as Nora and and our teams look at this together. I think they they, they can't be separated. You yeah. know, if we're going to rely on a property owner to do the maintenance, where we that would be risky for us to take on liability. It may be a different question if we take on full responsibility to plant, preserve, and maintain those trees and and or sidewalks. That may be a different question. But I think you're asking about as we might plant them in uh, lower income neighborhoods. That's kind yeah, of the middle of all that. So, it, and specifically, if, if we're restricting the, the species of tree to be a tree that you know does not typically have roots that would pull up sidewalks, for example, or have a lot right. of low branches, I, I would imagine we could right. mitigate risk through the species selection. But um, okay, and then finally, um, in terms of having resilience core members participate in tree plains, I think I heard different views already, just in public comment about whether they're already doing it in partnership with our city forest. Is that happening? Um, I, I don't, um, maybe is Avi on? He, I think Avi was gonna maybe be able to address some of this with what's going on in the parks, but um, go ahead, Avi. Thank you for the question, Mayor. Uh, Avi Otam, Deputy Director of Parks. Yes, we are coordinating with our city forest and uh, in partnership, we've evaluated a number of park locations uh, in communities and neighborhoods with high uh, heat, uh, or urban island index and we're looking to do a uh, planting of about 200 trees within the parks uh, uh, with the support of the resilience core members uh, so we're we're planning that uh, and we're looking to execute that in the next couple months could i just you know going back to what council member carrasco really painstakingly demonstrated to us is you know as we think about the most direct impacts of trees and the most direct benefits it's where people live um, you know, including, you know, every every family that's going for a walk along the sidewalk, uh, including reducing the incredible costs uh, to 
and mess, most of us don't have air conditioning, but obviously cost to, to keep a, a, a home cool in the summertime and so forth. It seems to me that street trees um, are, are really what's so dramatically missing in low income neighborhoods. Can I just ask why aren't we focusing on the street trees since that is I, what I hear from my, my constituents, I hear that to be the greatest concern is that there are no trees on my street. I, or John. Yeah, I think we would love to we would love to take on a program like Portland and be able to plant more street trees as Councilman well, Carrasco's slide. Could show. we start with the 250 we've already budgeted? That's my question. Yeah. I'll be just describe we're gonna yeah, put we've them got all parks and it's not gonna address Council Member no, that's concern or the concern. That's a different the, the, the 250 on the east side is a separate BD mayor. We'll, we will okay. be putting those yeah, in the they are going into locations that the okay so then if we have resilience core members who are able to help provide some of the labor why wouldn't they also be helping with street trees uh, i guess i'm trying to understand in what sense you mean planting them yeah avi just yeah, said that yeah. they would be in parks <laughs> so i'm yeah. trying to understand well, we have yeah. an intense need along street uh, in in the uh in the park strips where many streets um in central San Jose and in East San Jose simply lack trees. Why wouldn't Resilience Corps members go there? I don't think there's a reason they can't, Mayor. I know that the, there's actually like logistically there was a spin up period where Resilience Corps was working with PRNS directly, and that was kind of how the program was, was conceived. Um, you know, and again, I've been both speaking with Avi and Dorsey Moore, and I think there is a possibility for us to explore planting uh, street trees, both OCF and Resilience Corps. Um, I think the Resilience Corps staff would need some training, you know, as far as how to work in traffic and how to work safely in the streets, but I don't think those obstacles are insurmountable for us. Uh, so I do think it's something we can absolutely explore. It's more a function of capacity and experience, not that it's something that can't be done. So I, I think it's absolutely something we can explore uh, very soon. Okay, I, I would encourage it because if we're talking about the trees that are most impactful to our residents, particularly in canopy deprived neighborhoods, it's, it's the street trees, it's the trees by their homes and I really think that that's where we can make an impact. Uh, Councilman Crosco, I saw you raise your hand for a moment. I, I just wanna chime in on this. So so this is where some of my, uh, my confusion, I guess, comes in as we're trying to figure out where to put trees. And, um, and, and sometimes I, I feel like uh, we're, all, we're all on the same page, uh, but also talking in, in circles a little bit. Uh, because as you see those pictures, Saint, my, my, I have the same thought process is we need to figure how to remove uh, whatever obstacles are before us. And I think that sometimes we're our own worst enemies as we set up these uh, these reasons why we can't do the things that we should be doing. And and we're trying to solve a problem. And what is the problem? Well, number one, it's just increasing the canopy. That's the overarching goal. But the other is, if we're going to do it anyway, let's do it where it's most impactful, as the mayor had said. Uh, but but the other issue is, uh, we know where we own the land, and the land is in parks, in uh, mediums, and uh, in certain uh, you know sidewalks and areas. My issue is, I, I don't necessarily want trees in mediums because people don't walk in the middle of the street. So I don't want the trees right. in the mediums don't give me a, a map of the mediums that has that should be like your last resort in my opinion because if i'm sitting in a car i i enjoy going underneath a tree in a car especially if i'm stuck in traffic but that's not the greatest benefit i want a single mom or a mom who doesn't have a car and is pushing that stroller and it's walking down the uh, sidewalk because we're trying to encourage people to get out of their cars or because people don't have a car and they need to get to that bus stop and we want them to have uh, cover. And so we want them in walkable communities because that's been the goal, right? So let's integrate the plans that we've been talking about, that we've been boasting about, that we've been uh, encouraging and we've been selling these plans to our communities. We've been encouraging them in our urban villages. So this is where we should, urban villages should be packed full of beautiful trees and neighborhoods, you saw the neighborhoods, they're woefully 
uh, scarce in terms of the trees. So those are my preferences. I don't want them in the mediums. That's not my preference. And uh, and I keep, anyway. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I have a feeling what got confusion, got confusing here is I think Rick said something about them working in the streets. And, and Rick, I assume you didn't mean literally putting the trees no, in. No, no, but I'm getting maps where my 250 trees yeah. are gonna go. And some of them are being designated in the mediums. Oh, and, okay. And this is where why 250 trees who that have been designated right. since since June of last year have not been planted yet. All right. So if I can just add a little bit more clarity to that, one of the biggest challenges we face, if we really truly want to put these trees along our sidewalks to get them so that they're more walkable and enjoyable and so forth, is really it's that equity issue of the maintenance responsibility, not just for the tree, but the related sidewalk damage that they may ultimately cause. That it, it's a tough sell to those, those property owners when they already know that this tree is likely to cause problems for them in the future, they really don't wanna take that jump and put that tree in there. And because the majority, we, we probably got 30,000 plus vacancies along frontages for property owner locations, residential, neighborhoods, et cetera. When we talk about our medians, our landscape backups and so forth, um, you're only talking about a 10th of that. We only have probably three, four, 5,000 trees that we can put into those city controlled areas. So it really is about addressing that equity issue and convincing property owners what we can do to help them to maintain these trees in the long term, because they know ultimately they're looking at thousands of dollars potentially in costs long term as the sidewalks need to be repaired, as the trees need to be pruned every five or six years. It, it just, that's our biggest challenge with the majority of our street tree locations. Doesn't mean we can't do it. We just got to figure out how we can do that and address those equity issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Crosco, did you have anything more? No, okay. All right, I think we have a motion. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? Bully? Aye. Han? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, uh, we're on to the uh, item 3.3, which is approval of mid-year budget review report. We have a presentation, Jim. Yes, Mayor, thank you. I will try to have a, a brief pr uh, pr presentation here. As I know, council still has a number of policy issues to go over here tonight. So we will um, try to keep this um, so, uh, brief. Anyway, yeah, so uh, my name is, uh, good evening, my name is Jim Chan, the city's budget director. Um, I'm joined here tonight um, by Bonnie Duong, our system budget director, and Claudia Chang, our deputy director, to uh, walk us through the 21-22 mid-year budget re 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 review. Um, through its budget policies, the city council has designated mid-year as the appropriate time to perform a comprehensive assessment of the current year's budget and the mid-year review report as a vehicle for consideration of any necessary budget re revisions. To prepare this report, the city manager's budget office, working with all city departments, analyzed the status of the city's operating capital budgets contained in over 135 different funds. Based on that analysis and the receipt of some several new grants or reimbursements, budget adjustments are recommended in the report for city council consideration. So we are super proud of this report. There's a lot of information in it. Um, the, uh, the other senior managers on my team are listed here in the budget office work really, really hard on it. That said, we're going to do a really quick overview and hit the high level points of, of this re report um, uh, in the next few, few minutes. So uh, from a big picture perspective, this is a good news mid-year review on the, our operating capital funds are generally performing as expected, uh, mostly um, uh with those few significant exceptions in the positive realm. So that's really good news. We are still, you know, obviously working and struggling through the pandemic, which um, is, is taking longer to get through than anyone had hoped. And we also know that it has pretty disparate Im, Im, uh, impacts on uh, the different aspects of, of our community. But the recovery in many areas has been swift and revenue growth 
um, in a lot of areas has rebounded more quickly than expected. So we've got some budget actions that are recommended in our various, various funds to reflect that as well as to make some other adjustments. Hitting a couple of the economic um, conditions, we have our employment levels are, you know, took that really big drop with the pandemic start, but we are on the right path to getting to back to where we were. I'm still not, not quite there yet. When we look at the unemployment rate, we have an unemployment rate in the San Jose metropolitan area of about 3% as of December, which is just above the 2.6% we had in February of 20, 2020. So, so definitely creeping up, up there. Um, it's not a surprise that there, when we talked about it previously, the real estate activity um, is, is very um, hot still. Um, this is a, a chart showing the residential act activity where you see the dark line of the sales price, which never really has gone down. Um, and the sales, which is the dash line, had a little bit of a dip, but then has been at pretty strong levels, which means that we get some pretty good revenue growth for some of our transfer taxes, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, a not so bright spot and an, a lagging area in our, is our hotel activity. Um, we are rebounding from where we were in 20, 2020 as of uh, December, but we're not back nearly to where we were pre-pandemic levels, and we're actually trending below forecast in the current year. So we have some adjustments to reflect that. Uh, sales tax, we've, you know, again, we talked about this. We saw a pretty strong surge of sales tax at the end of last fiscal year. The first quarter payment we have, which um, is all we got right at the moment, which is July, August, and September, were really strong. And this chart here compares the first quarter of sales tax this fiscal year with the first quarter sales tax last fiscal year. Um, and we can see that we've got some pretty solid revenue growth in all of the different categories, um, especially general retail and food, food products, which were in, uh, impacted by the loosening of the public health orders. And then transportation, those high prices of uh, cars um, definitely uh, impacts that, that category as well, along with inflation generally is, is typically positive for um, sales tax. One of the things that we're going to look at, you know, on a going forward basis, we have definitely shifted, you know, um, uh, our, um, the amount of, of purchasing power that has gone towards services versus uh, taxable goods is definitely swung in the taxable goods direction. And so we want to evaluate how that's going to continue on a going forward basis as we sort of uh, get out of the most immediate impacts of the, of the pandemic. From a general fund assessment, our revenue growth in the first six months is really strong. Um, we're on pace to exceed budgeted level, levels by year end of approximately $100 million. Of that amount, $50 million is due to the real property transfer tax, the Measure E um, ballot measure, which was approved in March of 2020. 2020. Um, those are generated by real property transactions, both residential and commercial. We've had a lot of commercial act activity in the first six months, especially a lot of high dollar value commercial transactions that really drives up the, um, that revenue category quite a bit. Um, and so we're probably, uh, we're going to see revenue growth of the, above um, the original budget estimate of 40 million going to 90, 90 million. We are going to allocate or recommending allocation, all of those to the existing measure E reserves in accordance with city council policy to have all of those funds um, dedicated to construction of affordable housing and homelessness prevention. Um, but uh, we do have an action as, as we've talked about earlier today um, on next week's council agenda to relook at how that policy is, has the different buckets of all allocation um, which is the first step in a sort of a many months process to to uh, to change how those monies could be could be allocated. But today we're just recommending allocation in accordance with the existing policy. And then we have thirty million dollars um, allocated to a revenue loss reserve. As we had mentioned um, in previous meetings, we were informed by the state um, uh, that that they uh, dispute some of the some of the tax revenues that we have been receiving. Um, it is you know with limited exceptions. Um, the uh, information about um, tax records, they are confidential under state law, so we don't uh, say too much. We can't be much more specific than what we have here, although we will touch on it a little bit later in a couple of slides. Um, so we want to make sure that money is um, put in a reserve and not available to be spent against. Our expenditures are tracking about uh, to have savings of about five to seven million dollars, or I expect that number to grow a little bit by um, as we as we get closer toward the end of the year. And finally, we have a recommendation to establish our ending fund balance reserve for 21-22 of 12, 12 million, which is about half of what we had uh, included in our for forecast. So as part of our ongoing forecast, we always need to have some amount of money 
that we expect to get either from additional revenue or some expenditure savings such that com uh, combined they're about uh, 20, $25 million or so for 21, 22, we had estimated that at $23 million. So we're estimating to establish that here. We have a number of, of general fund adjustments allocated to various cat categories, um, as you see reflected here on the slides. Um, the first category is urgent fiscal program needs. Um, our, you know, as city council policy really is to, the mid-year budget is not to really do new things or do new policy. Um, it's really about truing up the budget based on new information and to implement city council direction. Um, but we do have a couple of, of items that uh, we wanna bring, bring forward for things that, that probably should not wait until the proposed budget process is when we normally would do things. We have two items here. They are net um, zero impact to the general fund. The first one is a recruitment and retention action to provide some temporary staffing to the human resources department over an 18 month period to focus on recruitment and retention um, to get at our vacancies, um, looking at some classification and compensation studies, some uh, better uh, out, out, outreach to our schools to our, improve our employee pipeline. And then uh, we also have um, that, that, although that particular action is fully offset by vacancy savings in other departments. So of, of the amount of funding that we're recommending there for the recruitment and retention of about $800,000, that's fully offset by um, vacancy savings in other departments. So we're taking down budgets in the city manager's office, the IT department and the transportation department to fully offset that, that cost. And we're recommending uh, to start early on our budgeting software upgrade. We have to upgrade the platform. Um, in addition, there's just some improvements we really have to make to improve the accuracy of the system and to really save folks time, both in the budget office and throughout the departments. We spend really uh, too much time on our budgeting software. So we want to get that going before uh, the start of the 23-24 budget year in August of, uh, of, of, of 2022. Um, then we have a number of required technical rebalancing actions uh, that we'll get into in a moment, which is just to true up some, some budget based on some new information and to implement city council direction. We have a number of grants, reimbursements, and fees that each of those individual actions uh, are offset by a corresponding increase to revenues for grants or to re reimburse for costs. And then we have a few uh, cleanup adjustments that are technical transactions, such as a fund balance reconciliation or closeout or moving money between appropriations to accomplish the same task. I'll just hit a couple of the required technical rebalancing actions on the revenue side before turning it over to Bonnie for a second. We already talked about the measure E actions. So those $50 million of revenue is offset by the allocation to the reserve. We have uh, the sales tax increase, which we talked about sales tax is doing uh, quite a, a bit better. We get our second quarter of sales tax receipts in a couple of weeks, so we'll have a little bit better idea um, but but we, we do feel confident in increasing the estimate to 20 by $20 million to get to $300 million of sales tax revenue. We do have some new information from the county on our property tax uh, re uh, revenue es estimates. In particular, our um, ERAF allocation, our education revenue augmentation fund um, is going up by about $7 million and general security is going up by another four. I do want to point out that there is litigation that the school districts um, have levied against counties for their for their calculation of the ERAF revenue. Um, so um, that is potentially at, at risk, but it's likely that that litigation process is going to take um, a little while. So we're going to uh, need to still count the revenue as it's, it's coming in. And then uh, business taxes are, are, are doing well. Card rooms are mostly back to full operation, so we can see some additional revenue there of six six million and then another million apiece for cannabis uh, taxes and our disposal facility tax a few transfers and reimbursements we're bringing in the largest is um we as uh, is, is the portion of our construction and conveyance tax revenues that's largely in the capital funds but there is a small portion that that, that goes into the general fund so that's about a two million dollar uh bump up there from the the cnc funds and then uh, $1.4 million is a transfer from the American Rescue Plan to the general fund, um, which is in accordance with the US Treasury Department guidelines on calculating revenue loss for the city at, uh, as a whole that we're recommending to al allocate per council direction to um, Office of Equality Assurance software um, that'll be shown on the next slide. And then PRNS fee activity, which had been really low um, because of the public health restrictions are starting to rebound. And so uh, we're starting to see the, the, the little bit more normal um, uh, use of the typical 
um, happy, happy hollow and other uh, fee activities that PRNS engages in. And so want to recognize that revenue there. And then we still do have the downward adjustment of the TOT fund, um, the, the, the TOT and the general fund of a million dollars. And we also have some corresponding actions in our TOT special fund, as well as our convention center and cultural facilities district special fund um, as well. And we'll have to keep an eye on that as we go into the proposed process. Bonnie? Thanks, Jim. Um, so here on this slide is a list of the required technical rebalancing actions. Um, it's just a continuation. Um, so I'm not going to go through every single item that's here on this slide, but I just want to highlight a few of them. Um, the first one, which Jim had mentioned earlier, was the revenue loss reserve. We're establishing it um, for $30 million, and it sets aside funding um, in response to the state's recent initial determination that a portion of the city's uh, previous and current tax revenues could be significantly lower. Um, so while the city disputes it and will appeal the state's initial determination, uh, this re reserve will set aside um, the disputed revenues in 21-22 to address the potential negative impact um, to the general fund um, if the determination is, is adverse. Uh, the next item is the establishment of the 21-22 ending fund balance reserve for $12 million. Um, and so like Jim had mentioned, you know, we always assume a certain amount of fund balance that's going to be available at the end of the current fiscal year, which will be available um, beginning of next fiscal year. Um, so this $12 million gets us about halfway there. We had assumed $23 million of fund balance that would be available at the end of 21-22 for use of 22-23. Uh, the next item is the Community and Economic Recovery Reserve in the amount of $8.8 .8 million. Uh, this reserve supports the recovery work streams and initiatives that um, will support the recovery work streams and initiatives that unexpectedly arise and will be considered as a funding source in the upcoming budget process for the potential continuation of existing work streams into 22-23. Uh, so this reserve is offset by several other uh, recommended actions in the mid-year report. One of them is a decrease of $9.2 million in the fire department's personal services appropriation uh, to reflect the shift of, of eligible emergency medical services support expenses um, from the fire department out of the general fund and into the coronavirus relief fund, um, which is being closed out. This reduction in the fire department's appropriation um, will offset the recommended actions to provide an additional $300,000 for consulting and planning support services um, and also to establish this reserve. Uh, the next item is a net increase of $2 million across various workers' compensation claims appropriations. Uh, this aligns the funding with anticipated activity and also to fund one-time settlements. Uh, the next item is the establishment of the hazard mitigation mitigation grant program for $1.4 million, um, of which uh, about a million dollars is offset by um, revenues from FEMA. And then um, there's a city match in there of $350,000. Um, this program is for seismic retrofit. Um, so it will they'll fund the development and designing of the program, help identify and locate parcels, um, and then implement the program. Um, and then we are, um, there is a recommendation to establish the Office of Equality Assurance Labor Compliance System for $1.4 million. Um, this is funded through a transfer from the American Rescue Plan Fund, uh, which Jim had mentioned earlier. This funding will provide for the implementation of a new software system to assist the Office of Equality Assurance Labor Compliance efforts. Um, and this was directed by City Council with the approval of the um, memo that went on November 30th regarding the COVID-19 pandemic response and community ec economic recovery uh, budget adjustments. Um, lastly, the last thing I wanted to note is that there is a $100,000 increase to provide funding for redistricting outreach efforts um, by informing the affected residents of the district boundary changes. And with that, I will turn it over to Claudia. Good evening. I will highlight three capital funds that are major revenue streams for the city's capital program. The three tax, taxes listed on this slide are levied on construction and property resale activity. Construction and conveyance tax, which is the one represented by the gold bars, is an economic indicator of the real estate market. Through December, CNC tax collections totaled close to $30 million, which is 78% of the 21-22 adopted budget estimate of $38 million, and is anticipated to end the year at $60 million. 
Building and structure construction tax, which is the green bar, are tracking lower than expected. Through December, this tax receipt totaled 6.9 million, which is only 34% of the 21-22 adopted budget estimate of $20 million. There have been lower than anticipated development permit activity in all land use categories, such as residential, commercial, and industrial. This collection level is below the prior year's collection level of $16.9 million for the same period and is anticipated to end the year below the budget estimate of $20 million by $1 million. Construction excise tax, which are the blue bars, are also tracking lower than expected. Through December, tax receipts totaled $6.1 million, about 34% of the budgeted estimate of $18 million. There have been lower than anticipated residential and commercial development permit activities. This collection level is below the prior year's collection of 12.4 million for the same period. Based on collections through December and a look at projects in the pipeline for the remainder of the fiscal year, tax receipts are expected to end the year below the budget estimate of $18 million by $2 million. We'll continue to monitor these revenue sources as the fiscal, as the fiscal year continues. Next, I'd like to highlight the airport funds. Through December, airport implained and deplaned 4.8 million passengers, an increase of 192% from the prior year's level of 1.6 million passengers, yet still 42% below year-to-date levels in fiscal year 20. Passenger operations, takeoffs and landings, are 61.2% above last year's levels. Given activity to date, passenger levels are tracking to exceed the 21-22 pro projection of serving 7.5 million passengers. Landing fees, terminal rentals, and airfield revenues. These are revenue categories associated with the number of flights rather than the number of passengers are tracking just below estimated levels and largely due to lower than anticipated airline landings and use of common gates and ticket counters. The airport continues to work with concessionaires, airlines, and other tenants to help mitigate the pandemic's impact, including providing financial relief when necessary. The city council recently approved giving the city manager the flexibility to amend agreements with airport tenants where the amendments would provide financial relief through December 31st, 2023. A total of 59.6 million of federal relief funding is allocated in 21-22. The timing and use of the federal relief funding will be determined by revenue performance. Thanks, Claudia. So that was just a taste of all the great information that is in the mid-year budget re re review. Um, this, looking forward, you know, after you know approval of the mid-year report, really sets the stage um, for the budget process um, for 22-2023. And so um, we are going to uh, transitioning now to working on the budget request and the five-year forecast that will release at the end of the month. Uh, the mayor's March budget message um, will be heard in the middle of March. And then April, we get to uh, creating the proposed budget documents and have city council budget study sessions and community budget meetings in May, um, where we have the final public hearing uh, in June and uh, review and approval of the mayor's June budget message, which then formally adopts our budget for the 22-23 process. So really want to thank um, uh, all the staff for the work on the, the report and all the departments that contributed to it. And we all stand ready for any questions council might have. Great, thank you very much. Let's go to the public. Tony. Mayor Beekman. Hi, thank you, Mayor Beekman. Uh, thank you that at the beginning of the pandemic, the mayor had already mostly prepared a, a balanced budget program for the future of San Jose. And that I assume we are still relying on at this time and has possibly become a model for this country. And at the same time, Councilperson Raul Perales was also working much for these balanced budget practices to have an important focus with the deeper concerns of equity issues. An important reminder that the initial intention of subsidies is to help people of a low and extremely low income. Please learn how to always want to work towards and honor the simple, the simple idea and concept. And finally, openness, accountability, transparency, and clarity are incredibly important in upcoming budget planning are the ways of positive sustainability and in looking out for the other person in the next few years. These are simple, honest ways towards innovation and better public health and community safety as well. Thank you. Ryan Jones. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Ryan Jones, and I am a plumber pipe fitter with UA Local 393. I support the budget item for 1.4 million for the Office of <clears throat> Equality Assurance. This was identified uh, identified as a critical need back in 2017, so it's long overdue. Our city needs to do more to protect and empower working people to uplift the responsible businesses that pay work, uh, workers fairly and to prevent and prosecute wage theft. What the city <clears throat> what the city should do with the next year's budget is add additional positions to the OEA team to work directly with businesses, workers, and the County Office of Labor Standards Enforcement to form a collaborative community-based outreach. By doing this, workers will have a resource not only to file complaints, but be educated on wage theft, which will prevent these harmful acts from even happening. Forrest Peterson. This comment is in favor of the proposed budget adjustment for the Office of Equality Assurance. My name is Dr. Forrest Peterson. I have a PhD from Stanford Engineering. I have led an internationally recognized engineering research center collaboration with the Santa Clara County Wage Theft Coalition. I gave a year of public service as the county's first labor standards investigator in the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement. Today, I'll comment on the technology and software side. The key points I want to make, first, look forward to a new generation of artificial intelligence. Second, provide your office uh, professional development in the use of advanced data analysis, such as Python and R. The EPA now requires uh, before eligibility for some investigator roles. The difference is real. In my doctoral thesis, which in infrastructure heavy construction usually involves certified payroll just by the situation, and as a concrete labor and labor's union, I used to be subject to certified payroll. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I disagree with the past callers. We ain't going to the artificial intelligence that quick, homeboy. Um, with the 4.2% 4, 4. Uh, in taxes in the construction, and you got nerve to come here and begging for more money. You want to reduce that 4.2? No. If that was maybe 15%, maybe. But at 4.2, you're going to ask to take a cut out of that. I'm going to just leave that one there. And then uh, let me see. Uh, the reason why there's good revenue is because the COVID money that's been coming in, which the deaths on the east side paid for, and all the COVID infections on the east side, they paid for it with their lives. That's why you were able to stabilize the economy. It was on their bodies. So be, be, be very cognizant of that. Where is the racial equity office? They need to be here in this conversation. Erica Valentine. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Erica Valentine. I am a resident of San Jose and the political and development director for UA Local 393. We represent over 3,000 members in Santa Clara and San Benito County as part of the Building Trades Coalition. We stand in support and ask the City of San Jose to stand together with Local 393 to support this budget adjustment as an act of your commitment to fight against wage theft. I support the budget item for 1.4 million adjustment for the Office of Equality. As mentioned by my other colleagues, it has been since 2017 that this has been a priority, but yet there has been no action and no budget to reflect the commitment from the city to enforce this as well as put towards the effort of additional positions so that we can fight against wage theft. Thank you for your time and we appreciate your support. Brian Pores. Hi, good evening. My name is Brian Pores with UA Local Union 393. I'm here supporting working, working Partnerships USA. I'm in support of the $1.4 million budget for the Office of Equality Assurance to provide necessary resources and technology that the OEA staff requires to be successful. This critical need has been a long time coming and should allow to begin a more proactive approach rather than a reactive approach to maintaining labor compliance. It's time to stop pulling bodies out of the river and go upstream to see why they're falling in. Wage theft affects our entire community, and this would be a great start to protecting and empowering our local workers and their rights. History shows that when labor is thriving, our entire economy thrives right along with us. I hope that City Council utilizes this budget to establish a solid foundation to prevent wage theft and continue to build upon this foundation for years to come. 
I urge the council to consider future budgeting and funding for additional positions at OEA to focus on working directly. Krista De La Torre. Hi, my name is Krista Dalatori, and I'm the political organizer with the South Bay Labor Council. We represent over 100,000 working, or sorry, 100,000 working people in both Santa Clara and San Benito counties. I'm calling to support the budget adjustment of $1.4 million to the Office of Quality Assurance. These funds will allow OEA to integrate a much needed software for labor compliance and certified payrolls, which will help free up valuable staff time. This is a great first step in the right direction, but there's still more work that the city can do to support working people, to elevate responsible businesses who fairly compensate the workers, and to prevent and prosecute wage theft. For next year's budget, the South Bay Labor Council urges the city council to fund additional positions at OEA that focus on working directly with workers and businesses to prevent wage theft, and to fund collaboration with the county's Office of Labor Standards Enforcement for community-based outreach. The creation of this pilot program will enable the city to build a proactive force for outreach and education that prevents workers from being harmed. Lori Quevedo. Hi, my name is Corey Quevedo, and I'm a member of uh, Local Union 393. I support the budget item for 1.4 million for this Office of Equality and Insurance. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed extreme vulnerability of essential workers to illegal treatment. Workers of color, immigrants, and women in particular have been hit with everything from stolen wages to health and safety violations that can expose them or their families to serious illness, to being forced to go to work sick or illegally fired for trying to take care of sick family. We need to beef up the OEA to help ensure workers' rights are protected. Thank you. Louise Auerhahn. Uh, thank you and good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Louise Auerhahn with Working Partnerships. I'm also calling a strong support of the budget item for $1.4 million for the Office of Equality Assurance. It's long overdue, and I want to thank all of the council, City Council Members who responded to our calls last fall and voted on November 30th to move this forward and to include at least a small down payment on wage theft prevention and workers' rights in the recovery budget. This is, this is critical, uh, but it's just a first step. Uh, this will create the foundation, free up some staff time in OEA, but we really need to build more on that foundation to protect and empower working people, to uplift all the responsible businesses who do pay those workers fa fairly, uh, and to prevent and prosecute wage theft when it happens. Uh, so I urge you to support this item tonight, and for next year's budget, look at funding additional positions at OEA, as well as David Beeney. Hi, I'm speaking on behalf of the members of the Building Trades Council in support of this item. Part of the budget review report is a recommendation to fund new labor compliance software system to assist the efforts of the city's Office of Equality Assurance. The purpose of prevailing wages is to ensure that the public dollars support our communities and residents by upholding local standards for wages and benefits. And this safeguard is only meaningful when there's an effective labor compliance practice to ensure that prevailing wage and other labor laws are being observed. The use of reputable labor compliance software will free up staff from the basic functions of collection and organizing and will flag errors for, or violations for staff. And this will allow staff to focus on investigation and enforcement and reduce the chance of missing important information. The approval of this item will be a solid step toward giving the Office of Equality Assurance the tools it needs to protect workers, though much more is needed. Thank you. Frank Austin. Yes, hi, thank you. My name is Frank Austin, and I'm speaking on behalf of over 3,000 members of UA Local 393, which serve the Santa Clara and San Benito counties. I'm speaking in support of the budget item for 1.4 million for the office equipped equity assurance. With these funds, the OEA will be able to redirect valuable staff resources away from doing cumbersome paperwork by implementing software systems to help streamline the verification of wage compliance and certified payrolls. This valuable software system will allow the staff of the OEA to be more product proactive by seeking out offenders of wage theft rather than only being reactive to claims that are brought to them. Bringing charges and prosecuting the offenders will help to create an atmosphere and an understanding that wage theft will not be tolerated in our community. Approving this budget will be a great first step and help create a foundation to build on. But keep in 
Maria Maldonado. Uh, hi, my name is Maria, and with 515 in the union, and I support the budget item for 1.4 million for the Office of Equality Assurance. First of all, I want to thank the City Council to include West Death Prevention and Workers' Rights in the recovery budget. We need to do much more as an organizer. I usually say I could find West Death cases any day of the week. It's very important to prevent West Death, especially during the pandemic. Workers have been more vulnerable than ever, not getting paid, um, working overtime, not taking breaks, not getting paid sick leave, or even worse, being forced to work sick for fear uh, to face retaliation. Some workers can fi got fired for taking quarantine if they were sick with COVID. Um, I believe the city could do more to prevent this con to continue happening, and probably a good way to do it is focusing on it. If the Office of Equality Assurance works directly with workers and employers in next year, to fund collaboration with the county's call in user two. If you have a good union, you may not need to have these kind of things. Uh, I know I've had problems with wage theft in the past. The California Industrial Relations Board is the one that is able to uh, help you out. They always have. They're always really helpful. I don't know what the city is going to do because the city really doesn't do anything. I mean. Uh, would you want them to do this? I mean, they're, they, they, the city messes up everything. So I don't know what the reason is to spend millions of dollars when if you have a problem with your employer with, with any types of issues, whether it's breaks or being you know, wage theft or tip theft or whatever, the California Industrial Relations Board is amazing. So I don't know why this is a city issue when you, get, when you need to go to the state to, to, get, this, to, get, to get it fixed. And, and in the labor unions, God bless you, you guys should be able to take care of this internally. Back to the council. All right, I return to council. Uh, council member Esparza. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Second. There it is, okay. That's it, thank you. All right, appreciate your succinctness. Uh, council member Reynos. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody for um, calling in, all those folks who um, talked about the OEA's um, uh, software that we're finally securing after a number of years. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy that this is coming through. This is um, something that will help prevent um, folks from taking advantage of, of workers that um, uh, that have been hurting um, because of this pandemic and the recovery. And um, and thank you, um, Matt, for, for the work that you've been doing to lead up to this. Um, the, the other piece I wanted to talk about is the recovery task force that I know uh, Council Member um, Perales is, is guiding and leading. And, uh, and hopefully um, when that process is in uh, full swing to hear back from them, um, some of their recommendations um, that can assist our local economy, our workforce, um, it would just be wonderful to hear some of those recommendations in the future. I hope that can line up um, before um, everything's firmed up for this future budget season. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question about the 300,000 or so we're spending on the, the budget software. I know we, we spent several millions of dollars on a budget software upgrade in 2017 or so. And I know there were challenges in implementation of that. Uh, why, are we, <laughs> why are we spending more now? <laughs> uh, that's a great question, Mayor. Uh, so yeah, so the budget, upgrade to the Hyperion platform was part of our overall sort of um, payroll HR um, budget sort of project, which was a very, very large project. Um, we, uh, and so Hyperion is, is the system that we that we have, and we took it as far as we could take it in its, in its current iteration that it was rolled, rolled out. So there's, so there's two things that are going on. One is we, we need to transition to the cloud right now. We're on an on-premise on server, so we need to, to go to the, the cloud. But to really to take advantage of all of those 
um, benefits of, of the cloud, we need to redo how we calc how we use the budgeting system for our personal services budgeting. Um, what, what we use when we first got the system was what Oracle had provided and sort of built. And so, and that was the, that's the biggest angst for us. And so we feel the Hyperion is a good budgeting platform and we've spent, you know, Bonnie and Bryce and I have spent, you know, probably a good uh, 40 hours or, or more over the past month and a half working with, um, with some of our, our consultants to figure out how we could redesign the personal services budgeting component to make that more effective. Because that's what we've learned in our ex ex explorations is to get that right, you have to sort of build it yourself within the Hyperion platform. And so we feel pretty good about that. And if we take that on, then we think we're gonna see a lot of improvements in the time it takes for departments to do the budgeting for us to do it. And we can access some of the, the better functionality once we spend less time doing the data entry portion. And if, if I can add two things, uh, uh, Mayor and, and uh, Jim uh, alluded to it, but we are required um, because of the version we're on, we have to do an upgrade. Oh. And so with that, there's an opportunity to go to cloud and take some of the lessons that we've learned over these last five years uh, to make the processing part and the input part more efficient. And just by way of memory, um, the city's adoption of Iperion, we have the largest chart of accounts that I'd ever seen, and there were some difficulties that went through that. Um, but we've learned a lot over the last five years, and the budget team is, an, I, I would dare call them experts at this. So there is some improvements to the process and more precision that they can do with um, less input work. Um, Jim, I'm not sure if you want to add on to any of that. No, I think that's, the, you said it well, Right. And I think and we are um, offsetting this with a reduction to the IT sinking fund reserve to keep this sort of a cost neutral item. Okay, great. All right, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and thanks to your whole team, to, to Bonnie and Claudia and Stina and everybody who's worked so hard to get this together. I know this is just the start of the hard work in the next few months ahead. Uh, but thank you all. All right, let's vote on the motion. Mayor, Mayor, uh, Mayor, did, oh, uh, did you have a memo on th this item? Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> there was a motion from council member as far as it, maybe I should ask her first if she's willing to incorporate that memorandum as a friendly amendment. Yes, I'm willing to incorporate your memo, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, is that right with the seconder? Thank you for the for the nudge, Jim. <laughs> I think I seconded it. I, I, think that's I also right. seconded whoever okay, got it. All right, fabulous. One of those seconders got it. Okay, let's vote. Oh, no, Mayor, I have one more comment. My hand is raised. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so I wanted to ask, um, I didn't see on the screen if Matt Kano was still on it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. oh, good, good, good. Now I see you. Uh, Matt, could you can you talk a little bit about the next steps just for those folks who who um, called in and you know waited until 10 p.m. to figure out like what what are those next steps? What can we expect in terms of? I know the RFP is next, um, and uh, if you can just uh, outline that for us. Sure. Thank you, Councilman, for the question, Matt Kana, Director of Public Works, and and thanks also to everybody who stayed with us tonight. We definitely appreciate your partnership and support. Um, and um, making sure that our workers get paid properly um, and fairly. Um, this is about a nine-month process to secure um, to secure the software, um, and there's a, a lot of you know we need to we're going to work really closely internally with finance um, and IT as well um, to scope out the scope out the um, what will be in the RFP there. Um, and then we'll be putting that RFP out on the street probably in about three month time frame or so, assuming the funding gets approved. And then it's about a nine month process to put the RFP out, get the responses, do the evaluations, and get to council um, before we are able to procure. And it's so like Julia may want to add, Julia Cooper, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or? No, it, it'll go through our process of prioritizing and get to other projects in the queue right now as well. Okay. Well, wh where is that? How how would that compete? Because this this uh this project has been in the works for, gosh, I don't know, four years now. Yeah, we have we have an internal uh, procurement prioritization board, and there's a there's a formula and there's an analysis that's prepared, and Matt's team is already working through that. So the the committee will look at it next week, and um, you know, as usual, we're challenged by staffing vacancies across the organization. So we're, we will work as hard as we can um, to get this done. But 
um, it, it will be in line. Yeah, thank you for that assurance, Julie. I know I, I know that you all will. Um, this 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 particular one, I don't know how the scoring works, but if there's anything that can um, reflect how this will be um, just really crucial for the well-being and the uh, and the protection of salaries for the workforce now that's out there. Um, I know that you understand the some of the 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 uh, the delicate uh, um, balance of keeping um, the workforce that we have, and so part of that is is with salary. And of course, um, there's folks who are not uh, being protected right now, and so um, I'm I'm hoping that that could really count for something, and and move this really up this priority. Aside from that, we've already explored um, previous um, software or an attempt to uh, uh, for a software uh, development for this uh, particular um, uh, purpose, and it didn't work. And so, uh, you know, our, our workforce out there can't wait uh, another another year um, before there's this this level of protection and and um, an ability for our folks to be freed up to to do more of that um, uh, in field work um, so I, I'll, I'll take this this conversation offline but I really hope that you you've heard from uh, the wage theft coalition that is called in about how important this really is for everybody. And I, I, I know that you can hear that um, in their voices and, and in their requests to you, um, but we'll, we can take this offline. And, um, and if there's any, any additional information that we can provide to help make that case, please let us know. I'd also like to see, uh, Matt, King, Matt uh, if we could um, work with the Wage Theft Coalition and David Beeney. For these are the folks that know this field a lot better than I do, uh, in terms of those uh, level of details that may um, make a difference. And so, um, I'm just hoping to really drive that through. We, we've we've waited for oh my gosh, four years I think it's been since we've been working on this. So, thank you. Okay. Uh Let's vote. Um, before we vote, I just wanted to note that on the last vote, um, Arenas was absent, but she texted me that she had computer problems and couldn't unmute. So she has a yes for the last vote. And now I'm gonna call the vote for this. Um, Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Yes. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, item uh, 5.1 is the local streets resurfacing multi year project. Move uh, approval. There, there's a motion. Second. 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 Are there any comments from the public? Paul Soto? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, there was a uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, last, uh, about two years ago, Councilman Perales in one of the subcommittee meetings had mentioned, and he pointed out, he goes, Paul, you're gonna not gonna like this. And what he stated explicitly is what racial equity looked like with respect to pavement. You wouldn't think it's 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 innocuous. Ah, just yeah, just just pass it, pass it. No. He articulated beautifully about how the cars in certain areas of the city, their maintenance is higher. Why? Because the roads are not paved. Why? Because of equity. Now, either the equity office is gonna get over here and start doing their job, okay, or they're not. Okay, they need to consult uh, Councilman Perales on what equity sounds like, what it looks like, and what it looks like in, reflected in policy. Because if I don't see the oppression of my people reflected in a policy, then equity is not there. Thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. To try to quickly offer, uh, uh, I think Measure T can help with this uh, funding ideas. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to explore what can be different options, how the future of the Measure T 
commission process, public process can work, uh, check it out. You know, I think the ideas of openness and accountability I do with technology can be a much help to their to what the questions are asking at this time. So I thought I would just mention it at this time and uh, good luck in the efforts of the future of the commission. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you. Uh, and uh, John and Rick, I, I know that in pages two and three discuss how you've been uh, implementing uh, an equity screen uh, focusing uh, repaving and communities of concern. I appreciate that. I, I wanted to ask um, though about uh, quality and I know, John, we've had some offline conversations about 10th Street, and uh, I think we had a, a bad situation there with a the contractor, I think, uh, within a year. We were seeing potholes, now the potholes are back. What, what um, are we doing anything different now in our contracts that would just make sure that um, the contractors are on the hook for, for repairing this stuff for more than a year out? Yeah, thank you, Mayor John Ritzel, Director for Transportation, and Rick's here too to fill in if I miss anything. But um, when this particular contract is our resurfacing, so it's the highest level of work that we're doing where we're, we're grinding off a couple of inches and then completely resurfacing. So that's not the part you're referring to. Some of the other work we're doing in the pavement program is the ceiling work. And that's where you noticed on 10th and 11th and then actually I think Council Member Mahan had an issue on, I think it was Camden or- oh, Coleman. Coleman, yeah, thanks, Council Member. 2019. Where there is some delamination um, yeah. of the layer that we put down from the original pavement layer. So when we noticed that, and a lot of other people brought it to our attention, we've made a couple of changes. So the first one is we're actually rethinking some of, some of the roadways that we're either going to do resurfacing on or sealing and determine whether or not it really needs a, a further level of treatment, grinding, with the resurface or not. So that's the first thing as we went going forward. Second thing, since we did notice that there was some delaminating on this, we have uh, changed our specifications for future contracts to actually add some sticky layers and some other things that, that when the contractor puts it, puts it down, we think it's gonna last longer. But to get to your answer, what about quality from a current contractor? Well, that we do have in our um, specifications that there's a one-year warranty for work that uh, the contractor would be responsible for. Um, in some of those instances, especially the one in District 10, we had already passed that warranty period. And then in some parts of what you're referring to on, this, on 10th and 11th, we're beyond it. So we're, we're having to repair that. But I think with the, the changes we're making both in the specifications and just how we're applying uh, the right criteria to decide resurfacing or sealing is, is going to help us out. Um, Rick, did I miss anything on what we're doing with, with that to try to fix some of the warranty issues? And I, I want to mention also that we're, it's pretty rare. We're actually pretty pleased with our whole pavement program. It was a pretty rare occurrence when we were finding these. So it's certainly not an, um, a large scale uh, issue that we had. We just don't know what happened on 10th Street, why it was doing that. We're going to have to take a harder look at that, but it's certainly not happening throughout the city. It's pretty rare. So I generally agree with John, you know, 10th and Coleman are both high use streets and sometimes you've just sealed the street so many times that it's due for something different. So um, that's our, our team is taking that and kind of assessing what to do and making sure that we make those areas right. You know, again, as John said, we we are generally happy with our contractors and that one year warranty, you know, for paving 250 to 300 miles per year, we have very few, very few issues. And when we do, they fix them um, generally very quickly. Would going beyond the one year warranty, that be way beyond the industry standard? I mean, I know warranties come at a cost. I know, you know, to be honest, that's, Within San Jose, that's the only standard I've ever seen. Um, you know, I could talk to Matt and just kind of see what else is out there. There, there are some times where there's been a longer warranty. If the QAQC is a little bit on the edge of satisfactory, maybe we'll get an extended warranty from the contractor just to kind of make sure we're good. Because um, we do have our, our inspectors doing material checks and making sure things are going out the way the specifications uh, outline. Uh, but I, we could explore that. You know, it, it might raise the costs in the end, but we could definitely explore that because we do want to make sure that the roads last, you know, where they're supposed to last. Okay. I appreciate you asking the question. Uh, um, all right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, let's vote on the motion. Yes. Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. 
Carrasco? Carrasco? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, we've got uh, a little more than two hours left, and we've got a lot of items to go. So we'll all try to be as succinct as we can be. Item 8.1 are uh, objections on the hazardous vegetation commencement report. Removal weeds weeds or refuse. There's no presentation. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Okay. I see no hands up in the public. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, item 8.2 is the Envision San Jose General Plan Annual Performance Review Report. Uh, I'm told that the presentation will be passed in the interest okay. of times. Is that right? That's correct. We're going to okay. pass the presentation. All right, but Chris and Michael are here for questions. Uh, let's go to the public. Paul Soto? I don't get paid one cent. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I don't get paid one cent. I've been doing this for almost four years now. September will be four years. And you're going to tell me that in the interest of time, that you're just going to pass this along? My ancestors were swinging the short-handled hoe in the fields of Sasiquedes. Their time was, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll just take up all their time because it was taking up all of their life force and their energy. For what? To, 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 to fortify both Willow Glen and Rose Garden? And... In the interest of time, though, we're just going to pass this stuff up because we're tired. We're tired of city businesses. I'm not, and I never will be tired. And I will do this in the till the day that I go. And I will do it for free. Why? Because I would rather do what it is that I do for free than to accept the penny for doing what it is that needs to be done. Bill Borders. Thank you. Um, back in March of 2018, there was a memorandum uh, put out. Anyway, it's about the mobile home park overlay. And then two years later, in March of 2020, City Council voted to, yes, put a new land use designation called mobile home um, that would then add stricter oversight and so forth to all of the remaining 58 mobile home parks. And I just want to let you know that when you're looking at the Envision General Plan, this, this review each year, I just want you to know that pretty soon a lot of you won't be there. And all of those stories and all of that emphasis on getting that mobile home land use designation put into the general um, plan, um, it's essential to have it happen within two years of you voting for it and it hasn't been done yet so every couple of weeks i type it in onto the land use map and it's not there um so i realize it costs money but it's an important piece of what we were told would happen thank you blair beekman hi thank you blair beekman uh i think it's uh there's a, a bit of trouble a brewing uh in the future of the urban villages ideas i think the subsidy i keep trying to say the subsidy plans uh that's trying to help local low-income housing needs at this time is i think going to want to start to be used for these urban villages ideas in the next year or two and i i think we have to be prepared for that and we have to have real discussion about the future of subsidy use and how it's meant for low-income people and not for high-end developers and if you are going to use it for high-end developers please use it for extremely low and very low income concerns don't don't sell it out and uh it's an important thing i hope we can learn to more openly talk about uh the future of development and, and subsidy use and, and keeping it at the extremely low levels and in its initial ideals thank you call in user two it's amazing how late you guys go on one day can't stretch it over a couple days and then all of a sudden you start slamming through legislation 
that affects people's taxes, lives, maybe even real estate values. It's shady. You're a shady crew there at city council. You really are. It should be called it should be called a, a real estate office, really. But it's you you guys use a lot of tricks. This is the kind of stuff they used to do in the southern states, by the way. You guys are like a southern city with uh, with a rainbow flag. Uh, it's um, it's amazing how you guys do things. How you're you're not in, in with what the most of the residents really want. And there's a reason why you go till midnight on a Tuesday every single week because you don't want people to know what you're doing. You're shady. You're underhanded. Back to the council. Thank you. Uh, is there a, any question? Move approval. Second. All right, motion second. Let's vote. Menes? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Barza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, 10.1 is the land use consent calendar. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. All right, on consent. Also no. Comments specifically on this item. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe Land Consent. Um, all of the all all of these items that should be discussed are not being discussed. But yet you want to mouth equity. You want to mouth that oh, there's been historical injustices that have been done to people. But when it comes time to center it within the context of policy, all of a sudden we become amnesiac. Where is the racial equity office? They need to be here. They need to listen to these conversations and be taught because obviously they couldn't come up with the definition. You know who was given the most succinct, powerful definition? Councilman Prowls. He so knows we're, on, we're, we're, on, we're on a Yes, it has to do with land use. Quit interrupting, drive. Mayor. I'm talking. Let me finish my context. I only, got on a couple of, I only got one minute. I only have one minute, dude. So let me finish. Now that I can, time's run out. I guess you won again. Call in user two. I agree with Paul. You guys are real short with, with, with these items, land use and everything. This is once again, this is this is the shadiness of what you people do. Real, 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 real cunning. Sir, would you like to you speak on the consent late. item? You wait, you wait, you wait, real late. Drive. All right, let's move on. Okay, uh, is there, there is a motion, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Cardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, item 10.2 is the general plan amendment conforming rezoning on the center road property. Right, uh, Chris? Sorry, man, I was just having a little trouble getting off mute there. Um, I, th I think uh, similar to uh, 8.2, we're prepared to just be available for questions on the land you size. Um, okay. You don't want to make any presentation at all on a recommendation for denial? <laughs> well, I mean, so we're happy to make a couple of comments. Um, we just sort of had a discussion uh, previously about trying to keep things moving along. So, um, Jennifer, ahead. I didn't. Oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me, uh, let me have Michael just say a couple of words. It, it is a fair point, Mayor. There were a couple of these items that um, obviously staff had recommended denial uh, and the planning commission uh, had come up with a, a counter recommendation. So uh, Michael, do you want to just give us a couple of uh, quick thoughts on this one? 
Yeah, so the applicant is proposing to um, change the site at Center Road from neighboring community commercial to mixed use commercial and with conforming rezonings. Um, the general plan and, and therefore staff are not rec did not recommend this because um, the general plan very much focuses housing into growth areas. And so we acknowledge though this is a case where it, it would allow both jobs and housing, but particularly in the context of density bonus law where the site can convert um, uh, all to housing, even a market rate project providing some limited amount of affordability. We think it's really important to retain the commercial lands that we have within the city and focus um, the residential growth within our planned growth areas. The Planning Commission, of course, had a, a different recommendation, seeing a need for housing uh, in the city and 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 and, and acknowledging that you know, at least according to the applicant that the site would be developed consistent with the general plan, both with commercial and um, and and housing. I just we just quickly note there is no project on file, so this is only a color change on the map. So um, you know whatever happens will happen. It, it may it may be a mixed use project. It, it may be all residential using density bonus law. That's you know th that's not really certain. Okay, thank you, Michael. All right, let's go to the applicant. Shana. Good evening, Mayor Licardo, members of the council. My name is Eric Shanauer, and I represent the applicant on this item. Uh, if we can put a mostly vacant, underutilized site into productive use, that's a good thing. If we can get both more jobs and housing on this site, that's a good thing. If we can bring balance to housing production in District 7 by building market rate housing, that's a good thing. And if we can create more commercial space for small businesses, that's a good thing. For all of these reasons, we hope you will support this general plan amendment and rezoning as recommended by the Planning Commission, including the District 7 planning commissioner and council member Esparza. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Let's go to the public. Paul Soto. Paul Soto for the horseshoe. I knew it. I knew I smelled some. How you doing, uh, Mr. Schoenauer? Glad you can uh, grace us with your company. Um, I need this tape. I need this video. And I need what Chris Burton said. I caught that. You think I'm dumb? You think I'm stupid? I caught exactly what he's just said. That the, there was a memo or an email, something that went out by the city manager that said, keep moving it along. That right there, democracy has been circumvented. That's going to be part of that case. Because this city is guaranteed that they are going to be in court. And we are going to have a judge impartially judge what's been happening here in these meetings. Don't you do anything to this tape because I got you. I got you right there. Call in user two. Wow, man. Slamming it so late at night. Unbelievable. I mean, at least he has a. At least he has a guy come in and talk a little bit, maybe because you had to by law. But yeah, we'll we'll see how wonderful this development's going to be on Center Road. I look forward to the traffic, uh, the 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 orange cones, and all the stuff that goes along with quote development in this town. We'll see. We'll see how nice it is. I mean, I hope they're not going to be selling any single beers over there, you know, Carrasco doesn't like when they sell single beers on Center Road. Maybe, uh, who knows, maybe you guys are going to sell some pot there to get money for the city. Who knows what you're going to do? But it seems very, really, really shady so late on a Tuesday night. As usual, the city council should be ashamed of themselves. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, thank you for the words of Paul Soto. I mean, it was kind of nice to see that this project has been uh, rejected. Uh, Eric Schoenhauer has offered uh, his usual uh, interesting good logic 
uh, for a situation. And with that, uh, city government has still canceled it and, and said no to uh, uh, ending uh, pedestrian use practices uh, more better. As, but I don't know the depth of this issue, but uh, I feel it's off to a good start and, and, how, to, and how to address it. And uh, I hope we can continue in those good efforts of how to view this issue. And uh, in the end, maybe it needs to be rejected. Uh, pedestrian issues should take precedence in a way. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't know this issue better, but uh, it was nice to read on those good terms. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you, Councilmember Sparson. Mayor, um, so thank you to the planning staff and to the planning commission for their analysis. Uh, I, I understand the planning has made their recommendation based on the letter of the general plan. Um, this site is underutilized with 6,550 uh, square feet of commercial space and the remainder of this site sits vacant. Uh, the proposed change to the general plan designation and rezoning would require nearly 23,000 square feet of commercial, which would nearly triple the amount of existing commercial space and serving the need in the area, especially for office and retail locations. With the surrounding commercial properties already offering a healthy mix of neighborhood serving retail and services, including a neighborhood market, several restaurants, and a mix of small businesses serving this community's needs, this change would not result in a loss of community serving businesses, but expand upon the employment space. It would also allow for residential housing units to be built at this site for a maximum of 50 dwelling units per acre or a maximum of 54 units and then obviously, once a specific project is proposed, analysis is required to consider impacts on traffic, congestion, as I understand that might be a concern, although there is a bus line right here. Um, this land use designation would actually allow for greater density of housing units while also allowing the applicant to remove the requirement for commercial space. Analyzing the proposed general plan amendment and rezoning for this site specifically, I believe would be beneficial for the area. As you know, I have been a defender of um, employment lands. There are employment lands um, that nearby that where we're working on intensifying um, and, and this site would have an increase in the commercial space. Um, and uh, I also wanted to add that I really appreciated the discussion within the planning commission. In fact, there were several members of the planning commission who said it, the process benefited from having commissioners from all over the city um, participate in the discussion, many of whom actually knew this site, and they felt that it made sense for this location. So given that, I'd like to move uh, my memo, which was to approve the Planning Commission recommendation. That's my motion. Second. All right, other comments, questions? Um, Michael, uh, could you, do you have a map or something of this, this street? I think this is I an important context. I'll just explain if I can um, briefly. That's the aerial. We also have a zoning and general plan map. Now, if we go, let's stay on the aerial. As you can see, St. Mary, Maria Gretti, it's uh, almost across the street here, right? Uh, so this is a busy street, lots of, lots of folks uh, driving on Center Road. As I understand it, you've got commercial uh, in the next two parcels south of this side along Center, and then commercial all the way up the entire block of Center uh, on the other side of Lewis. Is that right? Um, uh, yes. So this would interrupt that string of commercial and it's a site that's right on a corner. Correct. Uh, this is a poster child for the very site we don't want to convert. This is a commercial site that's serving the community on a very busy road on a corner that's very visible. Uh, I have heard every single developer who has pleaded with me to ask for a conversion 
say this site is underutilized. I've heard that every time. And, and this is exactly the kind of site we don't want to convert. Um, I understand uh, that there, there's all kinds of momentum to go ahead and convert it. Uh, I think this is very bad planning and this is going to set a very bad, bad precedent for the city and it undermines the very spirit of our general plan. Um, and Chris or, or Michael, do you have any uh, anything to offer in response to whatever the applicant said and the information? Um, hang on, I can't find my microphone. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Yeah, I mean, I think, right. So I, I understand their arguments and you're getting both, but I think, you know, just be mindful that, um, you know, I think we're precluding other opportunities down the road for other commercial. And, and again, I mean, we don't have a project tonight, so there's really no guarantee here about what we're going to get down the road. And I think it's really important that, you know, once you do residential, it takes a lot of other opportunities off the table for future, you know, commercial uses down the road. So, and, and we don't really have a project here that we're really analyze and understand what we would actually get as a city. I think, Mary, just to add to that, you know, we know that mixed use development can be really challenging. Um, we know that the sort of commercial component is probably the hardest part. And so, you know, when you take a site on this and think about all the, the pieces that need to go with that, whether it's parking, whether it's access, um, you know, it, it, it does make uh, sort of the development of these types of, of projects uh, on these sites, you know, less likely, I think, and also in the current context with state law, what we've seen is, is any opportunity around housing just opens the door wide to, you know, a housing only proposal. Um, obviously, without a specific project on this site, those are the types of concerns that we're uh, wrestling with on this one. Okay, so Chris, what I think I hear you saying is this is essentially a conversion of commercial to housing in a mixed use uh, sheep's clothing. <laughs> in other words, they get the mixed use, they get density bonus, and all of a sudden becomes housing only. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's definitely the potential for what could happen, right? And, and I think we've just heard a lot about this conversation lately. Um, it, it's tough because it's sort of polarizing a lot of the opinions on this. Um, you know, where it, it's becoming sort of one or the other, and it's making it really hard for as, as us as a city to really think about how we get that sort of good development, how we get the right kind of development that incorporates different uses. Okay. Well, I think sites like this can provide critical jobs uh, for a community, and uh, we have the worst jobs, the housing balance of any major city in the country, and that's a key reason why we have the most thinly staffed city hall in the country, and I think we need to be concerned about that, particularly on key sites like this. Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, kind of along those same lines, Chris, can you explain a little bit, doesn't mixed use commercial require that commercial component? Or are you saying state law, which has been taking our land use decisions away from us for years, may may make that commercial requirement moot so <clears throat> it, it could right um the, what we've seen most recently so just to address your first question uh the mixed use commercial michael you'll correct me if i'm right it, it requires up to uh, a 50 dwelling unit per acre density with a minimum of a 0.5 far commercial requirement as part of that so what that, that's how we wrote the general plan um to sort of think about that that mix of uses and the contribution we'd see to the site. The challenge with uh, the state law is that in allowing housing, um, certainly any housing project that comes through, um, more likely with a, a, an on-site affordable component, can utilize a state density bonus law to concession out the requirement for commercial. Um, and so certainly this was the conversation we had around the four-year review at the end of last year. Um, so, you know, nothing certain, obviously, you know, the specifics of any project will have to be deemed through the application process. And um, I think this is part of the challenge when we see just the general plan amendment um, come on its own, is we don't always have that context uh, for what will happen uh, in the future. Okay, understood. On uh, So here's what I'm wrestling with, and I completely understand all of these, and I, I tend to agree with the mayor on these issues. I know we haven't agreed on a lot lately, but I do tend to agree with the mayor on these issues. My concern though is I have a site that 
asked for a mixed use commercial and would have built housing and ended up with a very large parking lot and a and a smart and final that has tons of airspace above it that could have been housing. And so I feel like that site, even though it's a brand new building, is completely underutilized where it is on uh, West San Carlos. And so I'm I'm that's what I'm grappling with, Chris, is if we leave it NCC, are we missing that opportunity for redevelopment that could be a much denser use? Right, and, and this is the sort of ongoing challenge that you know we're doing a lot of very site-specific planning in the general plan. Um, and part of that is just, that, that that's kind of where we've ended up. Um, the general plan is not intended for that very direct look um, at specific sites. It's intended to give us these broader categorizations in which we can work. Um, and then as we work through zoning and specific development proposals, um, you know, that, that's when we get into the, those specifics. Um, you know, the, the challenge we have, especially around kind of any mixed use project um, is that when we open the door to uh, that residential potential, um that you know uh state housing laws are just really favorable to that development um and so we can we can miss that opportunity michael thank you so i just want to point i just want to point out let me put a fine point on that if not for this threat from the state would you be okay with this change to mixed use commercial we'd still likely recommend denial just in the context of the general plan right um you know we, we've I think to the mayor's point, just looking at corner lots in particular that provide an opportunity for a future commercial development. And I know it's difficult to think about that in the context of the current market for that development. But um, you know, when we lose this, these sites, sites like this to residential, we never get them back, right? Even to mixed use to some extent, it's really hard to dial back the residential use. Um, so we would still likely come forward with a recommendation for denial on that. Okay. I'm going to trust your judgment. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks. Uh, sort of along similar lines, but I, I wanted to ask two quick questions of the applicant, uh, if Mr. Shane Hour is available. Um, Mr. Shane Hour, first of all, I'm, I'm sure you, uh, you know, can't make us a, a ironclad commitment, but what is the what is what is your client's intention for the site? Is there a vision for it at this point? Because I I liked what Councilmember Sparza laid out. I, I guess I'm concerned that may not be what we actually get. In this case, um, this is not a developer proposal. This is the current landowner, I a see. local a local family who would like to improve their property, and they think a logical development is to build market rate housing above and commercial on the ground floor. Um, they're not an affordable housing developer. <laughs> um, and I should point out that the city's general plan right now allows 100% affordable housing on this site with zero commercial. Right, you have general plan policies H 2.9 and and five and IP 5.12 that allow no commercial, but you can build affordable housing. So that's what you'll get if you were not to ap approve this. Then the only path the landowner has would be to sell this site to a nonprofit affordable housing developer who would build 100% affordable with zero commercial. So if you want a guarantee of no commercial let it stay as is, because that will be the outcome. And then I'm just, thank you. I, I'm just curious in terms of procedurally, is there a, um, is there a reason that, or, or is there a possibility of the applicant coming forward with a plan in addition to the general, a more specific plan and, and maybe engaging a potential partner prior to asking for the underlying zoning change? Well, no, the general plan and the zoning have to be changed at the same time under state law. So, um, and because the planning department opposes every general plan amendment that ever comes forward, no one's going to invest in 
designing and entitling a project without the basic question of general plan land use being answered. I, I understand that. Get, I guess I'm. Is, I'm we get I'm these just... inane, inane debates about preserving dilapidated patches of commercial land while we're in a housing crisis. The city approved only 1,200 housing units last year. This it's is a, a nine hour we can hear you. Four it's, a hour, it's a Shane hour we can hear you. You don't need to yell. Yeah, well, it's real frustrating that we're in the biggest crisis in the history of our city is housing and homelessness. And we keep for 11 years preserving shitty pieces of land Mr. Shane Hour, you're that, now that are suitable on. for housing. Mr. Shane Hour, you'll stop speaking. Councilor Mayhan, do you have anything more to say? I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cohen? Uh, actually, I see Councilmember Sparza's hand up, and I'd like some more of her perspective. I, I sure. can ask a few questions, but I want to see what she has to say. Councilmember Sparza? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so there were a few things I was trying to be succinct. I was going for succinct earlier. And so, um, so Mr. Shanauer is correct. This site could be built for housing right now. It could be built for housing. The fact is district seven has the least number of market rate units out of any council district in the city. So there's an imbalance. And furthermore, District 7 has the highest number of ELI units, second highest number of total affordable housing units out of any council district. Just down the road, um, along Lewis Road, there are over 250 affordable housing units. Within a mile uh, down Center Road is one of the nation's largest permanent supportive housing developments. Um, and so, so I get that, but also, you know, this site, I have defended employment lands many times before this council. Um, many of you know that I'm uh, working um, on an area, a stretch nearby a Monterey. Um, the, uh, we have worked very hard to lay the foundation for an economic development grant that we got to study how we can intensify or use opportun opportunity zoning to intensify job jobs along that stretch of land that is within the radius of this site. Um, so I wouldn't be supporting this if I didn't think it made sense. There is housing nearby, there's housing along the stretch of center. It's already there. It is not completely changing the character of this area. I do think that there, it's also an equity need for folks to be able to, uh, for middle income folks um, who want to live there, will be able to live there. There are amenities within walking distance. There is bus service there. Um, and furthermore, it is an equity issue because as um, as you all know, that the market rate development fees go into improving our parks and funding our school districts, um, which uh, District 7 has ended up with the most imbalanced um, land use really in the city that has led us to this point. Bottom line is, Again, I have defended employment lands many times uh, before you. Um, I do feel that this site makes sense and I wouldn't support it if I didn't feel that way. I think that's why the planning commission supported this site because they know this area as well and had a lot of debates about the community needs here. And that's why I'm supporting this, this set of change. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cohen. Um. Yeah, I, I thank you, Councilmember Sparza, for more context. Uh, it's helpful for for those of us who don't know the corner as well. And um, I mean, I'm familiar with the street, obviously, but and this is a tough one. Obviously, you know, it's a main corner, and so we want to make sure we do what's right there. And it's a little I, like Councilmember Mahan. I'm I'd be more compelling if I had seen like a mock-up of a plan or something from the from the uh, you know, from the owner to say, here's what we're intending here, because it's it's difficult to make the land conversion decision before knowing a little bit better about what would be coming. I, but I am a big believer in 
new approach of, of as Councilmember Davis said, you know, building the more vibrant density and building things of housing on top of res of commercial and not, you know, even if we preserve the commercial space, not going vertical is, is really not the way of the future, especially along main corridors. So anyway, that I just wanted to sort of give those perspective. I think the questions I was going to ask were, were answered. Um, I'm a little bit, I was a little bit torn, but I think it's, it was helpful to hear, um, you know, the reasoning behind this, your support for these kinds of proposals. So thank you. Uh, Councilmember Pross? Yeah, thank you. And appreciate the discussion here. I think we are all aware of the jobs housing imbalance that we have and how that impacts um, our city and our revenues. And that's something that we certainly, um, I think, agreed upon and, and then uh, attempted to, to find ways to continue to, to grow that, that job space. Uh, but at the same time, with that imbalance, we also recognize the other side of the, the conundrum here is that we have a, a, a significant housing shortage, specifically affordable housing, but, but just in general, just a tremendous housing shortage. And so because of some of our um, unfortunate land use decisions in the past of this, this uh, tremendous single family sprawl, um, we, we find ourselves having lost a lot of developable land. And in fact, even housing land that is just uh, not dense enough. Um, and, and thus, we have very limited availability of land and a need to be wise with the decisions, but also a need to be able to, to ensure we can maintain and create job space, but also create dense housing. Um, and uh, Councilmember Davis brings up a, a great example, actually, prior to her joining the council, but one of the first debates that, that I had um, along this these same lines, and that was uh, the development site where the former Mel Cottons used to be um, a hundred year business in the, in the city of San Jose, a family, longtime uh, property owners there, and business owners, and, um, and, and a very similar application where they um, had an interest to be able to redevelop the site, to rebuild Mel Cottons on the ground floor, um, but then create housing up above the site. Now, in that case, we actually know what the outcome was, as Councilmember Davis pointed out. Uh, the outcome was a Smart and Final that is unfortunately right across the street from a Safeway. And the Smart and Final doesn't have anything built above it. Um, so in essence, uh, we traded out a, a, a San Jose homegrown based 100 year old business um, that could have potentially uh, still be existing, is it existing today with housing above it, um, and, and we traded it out for a smart and final. And um, I, I think I, I, I fought at that point in 2015 because I also felt as though we could get the best of both worlds on that site. And, uh, and ultimately we didn't. And I think that we have to be both uh, good stewards of preserving jobs land while at the same time being conscious and intelligent about the opportunities where we can achieve both of our goals of, of, of jobs and housing, specifically dense housing. Um, and I think this is a prime example of doing that. I think we've, we've failed in being able to do that in the past uh, because of how stringent we've been and, and, and we've seen those failures in uh, projects like that Mel Cotton's, uh, former Mel Cotton site. So uh, I, I will be supporting this and, and, and uh, am, am hopeful that we can continue uh, to, to have these discussions, but also come to conclusions at times uh, that may go against um, some of the, the recommendations of the staff or, or where we feel our, our jobs um, focus needs to be and where we can achieve, uh, again, both goals. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Council Member, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Jones. Well, thank you, Mayor. So um, I think Council Member Esparza actually made some very good points uh, about the utilization of the site and the opportunity to have a mixed use uh, development, which I actually am very supportive of and excited about that possibility. But um, I think the core issue here is, I guess, is, is there an element of trust that the property owner will actually build a project 
that is a mixed use project as opposed to utilizing some state law that will allow them to just build all residential. Um, so I'm gonna actually direct, direct this question to Eric. Eric, you, I, I, and I have a similar, uh, again, project coming up later on where we had to have a certain comfort level in terms of the developer meeting their commitment to um, build the project the way they they promised to build it. So my question to you is, is there a process or a way for us to get some type of assurance or commitment that the property owner is gonna build the project that's been proposed? Tony, I think you need to bring Eric uh, into the, uh, the panel. <clears throat> if you're able to see, find him there. Yeah, I've, I've given me? him permission to talk. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah, did you hear yeah. my question? Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Um, well, I don't, I don't know how you do that, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I mean, the, the landowner is the proponent. The intent of the landowner is to develop their property. And the landowner is not a, an affordable housing developer. So building affordable units um, is detrimental to the feasibility of the project. So their intent is to build market rate apartments above with ground floor commercial. And under the general plan designation that's proposed uh, to do market rate housing, you must build a minimum of 0.5 FAR of commercial space within the mixed use building. And that math works out to about 22,000 square feet of commercial space within the building. That's the requirement of the mixed use commercial general plan designation. So that's all that we can say about that. Okay. So what would be the timeline um, if we approved this general plan amendment, what would be the timeline in terms of coming back with some type of design for the project? He's coming in as a panelist, so there'll be a, just a brief moment where he can't speak. Yep. Okay. Right. Um, I'm being quarantined. <laughs> Sounds like. I, I'm too emotional tonight. Did uh, you hear the question? Which I apologize for. Um, no. Yeah, no, I heard the question. Uh, well, the city's entitlement process, uh, the next step here is would be, if, it, if approved, is to get a, um, a site development permit for a project and to do the associated CEQA, project-specific CEQA. And nowadays, that takes the planning department, uh, you know, six to eight months to review once the plans and the application are prepared. And it would take a number of months to prepare the plans. So you're talking about a year, at least a year of process before we could bring the project forward. Okay. Well, that- Best case scenario, best case scenario. Best case scenario. Okay. Um, again, I'm, I'm struggling with this as well. I've been a big proponent of preserving commercial land, but I also uh, understand the benefit of having a high quality market rate mixed use project on that corner. So um, I'm going to support um, this moving forward or approving this, this project, but um, this is one, again, that we're gonna really struggle with and grapple with because if we don't have the opportunity to actually see the project and what it's gonna look like and whether it's gonna actually move forward, you know, there's always that risk that the developer's gonna do something totally different. So this is one of those where we're gonna to have to have a leap of faith and, and trust that, you know, your client is going to do the right thing and have a project that we're all gonna be proud of. So. 
That's it, uh, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Reyes. Um, I have a question about that site. I, I know that site because I drive by it every time I need to go to um, Costco on Center Road. Um, but now that I have one in my district, I do go there. Um, although they're slightly different. So I still go to, to D7, uh, Council Member Esparza. And every time I drive by, um, I see this building. And it's a house. It's basically like a, a ranch style home, a little bit bigger than that. But it is it is a yellow, um, like a lemonade, uh, neon yellow with brown and and I believe the reason that that it's um, it was painted like this was because over the years, as I've seen this over the years, um, the owner I think is desperate to sell it or for somebody to buy it, and uh, and I and the owner has put like signs on there, you know, uh, providing some kind of compensation if you're able to sell this home to sell this 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 place. I've never seen that in other places like that, and so I could always tell that it was you know um, family owned. Um, and so I, I get that uh, you'd want to have that place sold because it's. Um, it used to be a shop where you could buy mirrors um, and they would lay out all kinds of mirrors in the parking lot. How they were never broken, I don't know, but um, you can find any size of mirror inside. Now, that's not, it's a specialty kind of uh, a shop. You don't really find it any, anywhere. You don't really buy these kinds of mirrors uh, um, anymore. Um, and so... And it's on the corner where the rest of, where most of the, the remaining um, uh, shop, there, I think there's only one like cafe um, on the other side. But this is my question. There, between the cafe, there's this uh, like a little cafe shop and, and, the, and the corner home, there's a, like a lot, an empty lot in between. Does that belong, is this gonna be part of this project? I'm not sure who can answer. The, the staff has the aerial photograph of the proposed site. So I don't know if that would help you. You know, the aerial one is not, it is very forgiving. <laughs> we should actually take a street level look at this. Um, people would understand what the site that it is. So there is, uh, I think it's this this extended um, is is the site right next to it the the site that has the cafe on there um, uh, Mr. Schneller or uh, Councilmember Sparza you're familiar with that. And my, and my point being is that there is a lot that is completely empty and um, would be great for infill. And that's the question I had is, is that lot going to be included? Um, so I, on this aerial look, I, I don't know whether that's that empty lot because it's gated and separate from the, the actual home when you pass by okay. it. And here, obviously you can't see if there's anything gated off. This is not a cafe on this site. No, no, no. Next door to it, immediately next door is a cafe. But in between the cafe and the and the corner home, there's like an empty lot. That's right. Right? Yeah. Who who said that's right? Is that you, Eric? Oh, that was me, uh, Jim. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. there's an empty Thank lot you, between Mayor. the cafe and this site. Yep. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Is so is that is that empty lot part of this site as well? The, the Hello? Yeah. Hold, hold on, sorry, I'm having technical. I mean I be, I believe the Did answer is yes. yeah. The answer, the answer is, is yes. yes. Okay, great. Great. Um, 
and and listen the reason that i'm that i was asking about that is because i have a lot of infill lot i have all of these little empty lots um that are next to either a a, a home or a business and they are just magnets for uh, the folks who love to dump and 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 leave things there. And so it not only it, I mean it's an eyesore. It's a, you know it's a, a hazard for for the community. Um, I I uh, look forward to folks uh, building uh, infill, and and I've been an advocate for infill uh, development, uh, especially small development that way, um, because the the lots that are empty in my district are the ones that are difficult to build on. And usually it's because, you know, whatever mitigation, um, it, it is just challenging. And so when, when uh, an owner wants to take that on themselves, um, I find that, um, that they're willing to take that challenge on. Um, and, and, I, and this owner, it seems over the years, I feel like I, I kind of know this owner because of the, the messaging that they put on, um, you know, uh, their, 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 their level of want to really sell this and, and to do something better with this piece of land. And every time I pass by, there was always a different message. And so um, I've seen that struggle over the years personally, as I drive by. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and because I understand that need to, for it, um, infill development within my own district, I'm going to support this. I'm going to hope that that um, the rest of my colleagues can also support it. I know that you know your district the best, Councilmember Esparza. You've you've been uh, a fierce advocate uh, for your community and a defender when you think that there's something that's imbalanced. And I wouldn't think that you would accept a development um, very lightheartedly. Um, and I, I I believe you've given it a, some really good thought. And so I'm going to. Um, uh, support you in this and um, and look forward to seeing what this looks like in the future. Um, let, let's have, help this owner uh, move along and progress and and uh, build something that can be really part of this neighborhood in a, in a meaningful and beautiful way. Thank you, Councilmember Menes. Yeah, just a quick question for Chris or or Michael. Is there, you know, because I feel like we've encountered some of these in the past, obviously. And what I'm wondering is, is there any way that we go about tracking whether folks fulfill sort of their 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 promise, if you will, as it relates to some of these sites? Yeah, thanks for that question, Councilman. It, it, it's a, a good one and an appropriate one, I think. Um, it, it's probably on us to do a, a slightly better job of that. Given the the sort of the time it takes for development to occur on sites like this, you know, <clears throat> I think Eric was was giving you the best case scenario, but obviously, you know, when we do a land use entitlement after we've done uh, a land use change, it can be you know several years. Um, so it's probably worth us doing some additional work around that, just to identify those cases where it either has or hasn't worked out, uh, and and provide a little bit more context. I think also to keep in mind is that um, for mm -hmm. with housing projects, we, we, I mean, they can promise that, but as staff, we can't hold them to that promise. Um, and for state law, if, if you allow house, if the site allows housing, they, they can do housing. So, um, I mean, I think it's done in good faith, but there isn't any teeth behind it, just to be clear on that. But, but, but curious, for example, you know, earlier item of the evening was the general plan annual report and review. And so would it be worthwhile including something along those lines or along these lines of tracking some of these in some of those reports, whether, you know, every year some may come up, some may be delayed, but I think it'd be instructive for us to, to during the course of some of these conversations to better understand where the, how things are happening, how they're playing out after some of these discussions. I think that would be helpful and, and yeah. instructive, but anyway. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that is something we, we could do. I think it'd be interesting to see what, just for the council to understand, like, hey, we approved that color change in the map. I wonder whatever happened that night. And we Correct. Back on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I, obviously, I see where the votes are going. Um, 
I just wanted to point out that, you know, Mr. Shane Hour argues that the owner's only option in the current general plan is to build affordable housing. That obviously is not correct. The owner could build commercial, which is exactly what this is in the zone four and what the land use designation is for. And it happens to be really in a great commercial site um, with great visibility and lots of traffic. And you can see full parking lots in the, in the next shopping center over. Um, what I'm concerned about is, as you look closer at the site, that the building's not in great shape, that the, it's clearly not very well maintained uh, in terms of the, the surrounding area and yard. Um, and the message is if you're a landowner or property owner and you allow a site to fall into vacancy, and it's underutilized and falls into disrepair, you got a better shot at getting a land use conversion because you can just say, oh, well, it's underutilized. And you know, if Mr. Shane Howard tells us we have a homelessness or affordable housing crisis, and the, the conversion here is the answer for that problem is, of course, is proposing a market rate project. And if the argument is that District Seven deserves a market rate housing, well, the answer, the reality is, there's no assurance we're actually going to get it because once you convert this, it could still be affordable, uh, which, by the way, would be perfectly fine with me. I think either housing is great. Uh, I just think it's important to have that housing in the right places. Um, so in any event, I, uh, I appreciate uh, many arguments uh, that have been presented. I know this is tough for the council to ever say no to housing, um, but the problem is, is that we have really dramatically uh, reduced our available employment lands in this city. And as recently as when we took that vote on Coyote Valley and we have to be cognizant about the fact that we are not giving the next generations a great shot at the future, uh, as long as uh, they all have to get in a car and drive a long, long way to get to a job. All right, let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? No. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? No. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? No. Yeah. Motion right, passes. Thank you. Item 10.3 is a general plan amendment performing rezoning on the East Julian Street parcels. Sure, I'll just go over this really briefly. So what, what is before you tonight, Councilman Mayor, is a privately initiated general plan amendment to change the land use designation uh, of a property at East Julian Street from mixed use neighborhood to urban residential, as well as conforming rezoning from R18 to urban residential zoning district on a 0.97 acre site. The site is roughly a uh, thousand feet from the future uh, Five Wounds 28th Street, Little Portugal BART station, and is just outside of the Five Wounds Urban Village plan. Initial study was done. There was no um, significant impacts on the environment identified. The Planning Commission and staff made a recommendation to the City Council to find the proposal in conformance with CEQA, or find the unit and approve the proposed general plan amendment amendments and rezoning. And I am done. Thank you. Let's go to the public. Caller 5931. Press star six to unmute. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. This is Jerry Strangis representing the applicant. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, Jerry. Okay, uh, I'll be brief given the lateness of the evening. Um, the applicant supports the staff's recommendation, uh, supports the planning commission recommendation, looks forward to a robust process to develop the site along the lines of the urban village plan, which is adjacent, which is also adjacent to the new BART station. Um, available to answer any questions, uh, but uh, we support staff and we support the planning commission. Thank you very much. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. Um, I would gloat, but 
No. Um, with respect to this item, uh, the senor that just spoke, uh, I'm going to be in contact with you, and we're going to talk. And I'm going to let you know what you're going to be able to do in this city. Because what's happening right now, I don't know if you've been paying attention. Maybe when it comes to court, you'll pay attention. But for right now, you're obviously not paying very much attention to what's going on. Uh, to Mr. Schoenauer, I want to thank you. And the reason why, and I don't mean this in a smart aleck way, is that you are telling the truth. You're being very, very honest. Don't be afraid of your emotions. Emotions are good. That's what makes us human. I just wish there was more of it on this council, but it's at times very non-existent. Back to council. All right. Uh, are there any questions? Approval, approval, Mayor. Right. Second. Motion. Councilmember Prowl, second from the Vice Mayor. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Yes. Davis? Yes. Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Locardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. 10.4 is the general plan amendments uh, for the property on Sharon Drive. Thank you, Mayor. So this, this item is a privately initiated general plan amendment to change the land use designation of a property at 7246 Sharon Drive from neighborhood community commercial to mixed use neighborhood land use designation. It also would change the, the uh, it would do a conforming rezoning from CP commercial pedestrian to mixed use neighborhood zoning district. Um, there was an initial study prepared, no impacts were identified. Um, staff recommended denial of this privately initiated general plan amendment for um, many of the same re uh, reasons you've heard already. This property is designated commercial. It's um, right off De Anza. It's part of a grouping of commercial properties uh, uh, off of De Anza Boulevard that, that would present or do present us uh, opportunities for significant redevelopment for uh, commercial intensification or just new development. Um, so we're recommending denial. It's uh, the general plan does not support housing outside of growth areas, not significant housing, and this is not a growth area. The planning commission uh, disagreed and is voting or recommending that council approve the general plan amendment again um, uh, due to the need for housing, but also because they that they felt that the site's location um, was not a viable location uh, for for commercial uses, um, and as noted, it's an older um, one or two story office building that's that's uh, kind of run down. Um, that concludes staff's presentation. We're available for questions. Okay, questions. Uh, let's go to the applicant first. Uh, Tony, are you able to identify? I don't, the who is the applicant? Would be Odessa. Oh, Odessa. Okay. Yeah. Let's promote to panelists. She just needs to accept it. Okay, she's in. Good evening, Tony. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you also promote a Kirk? He's going to be um, um, doing the. PowerPoint part of it. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. My name is Adessa Bittadel, owner of Elevate Now Consulting, representing Ben Wang, who is the applicant for 7246 Sharon Drive. We thank staff for working with the applicant. We understand that the resources are strained due to staffing. However, we do not agree with their findings and denial of the GP application for GP 21-004 from neighborhood community commercial to mixed use neighborhood and conforming zoning of C21 dash 009. 
I was approached by the owner of the property in February of 2021 when I came on site to see the existing building conditions and neighboring projects underway and approved, I agreed to work with them as it makes sense. Not only that, it will be a benefit to the city. As someone who has worked as an economic development director and professional for four different cities for over two decades, I see no hope for this parcel to reinvent itself under the current GP of commercial neighborhoods. Ben has owned this parcel for the last eight years and has not been able to lease it fully. During the height of the economy, it was only leased at 60%, and now it is at 38%, while all other offices on the Anza Boulevard are at 93 to 100% leased. The reason is very clear, and when you speak to any commercial broker, they would state the same thing. This building is class C and D office, which is hard to market, while there are other newer products available nearby. It is also located within a neighborhood with no frontage to any major street and traffic. So from the visibility and signage standpoint, it is not located where it can be usable. We're also in a competition with the Saratoga and Cupertino markets since, in, since it is in neighboring those cities. Not to mention Sharon Drive is not a street or a drive. It is a cul-de-sac surrounded by homes. Ben over the years has tried to find other uses and there's no luck. No use under the neighborhood commercial would survive such as retail and restaurant, or as you can see, it is a lost cause with the current office use. Additionally, this parcel is now landlocked due to the proposed hotel development that is adjacent to the project, but fronting the Anza Boulevard. With hotel being the most economically profitable use and its vicinity to the Apple headquarter, the approved hotel development will forever landlock the applicant with no hopes for a frontage to a major street. Also, consolidation of parcels for development of a larger project will never occur with this site. The reason the applicant is seeking such change is that he is proposing to build 10 live, um, work units that will be standalone, much like a townhome with a business on the first floor and top two floors designated for living spaces. An owner can own a business on the first floor of the building while the entire living spaces would be at the second and third floors. These are the concepts that we have been working on and sharing with staff on Council District 1 office. We respectfully disagree with the staff's assessment of the GP and here's why. The concept of live workplace that we have been working on is the most sustainable format of development surpassing any other land use. Therefore, this land, change, land use change is 100% consistent with the following GP policies the staff has used to deny the change, such as efficient use of residential and mixed use land policy, reduces motor vehicle, well, we are in conformance. Housing environmental sustainability and policy minimizes greenhouse gas emission. We're consistent in conformance. Air pollution and emission reduction policy minimizes automobile dependent development. We're in conformance. Commercial policy, retain commercial land to provide jobs, goods, and services for San Jose's workers, residents, and visitors. We're in conformance. In fact, neighbors have agreed with us as well. We walked the entire neighborhood and have gathered over 60 signatures of support. They want to have a live work product within their own neighborhood. The petition of support has been, to the, has been submitted to the city council as well. Our proposal will not be the first successful concept. Um, although you always hear that these products are not successful. There are other successful examples of live workplace. This is an example of a vibrant and innovative project in a neighboring city. As you can see, there's a startup company on the first floor, a hair salon, and also an insurance company. We believe that design for our project will surpass this current project, as you've already probably seen the design. The GP amendment to MUN will allow us to have a win-win solution for an innovative way of achieving much needed housing, retention of jobs, and yet sustainable development in an area of the city that is already fully developed. I want to um, uh, thank you for your time and we respectfully request the mayor and city council to adopt a resolution for amendment of the GP 2040 from NCC to MUN with conforming zoning. In closing, we would like to thank Vice Mayor Chappie Jones and council member Raul Perales for their memo in support of the GP amendment. We also would like to thank Vice Mayor Jones staff and in particular Cassidy, Rania and Onali for their exceptional work with the applicant over the last year. I am available to answer any of your questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Pippadal. Uh, let's go to the public now. Call in user two.
call in user two. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, thank you for that report. Um, one of the things that I had noted is that I'm gonna be glad that my time will be up here by the time like this stuff is built out like to its fullest potential. And so I'll be gone by that time. And I'm glad, I am glad because I don't wanna live in a world that looks like that. And the reason why is because I've done time in Soledad State Prison, okay? This looks like exactly like Soledad State Prison. If I showed you a picture of Soledad State Prison, the way it's laid out, how many floors, the windows, and then I showed you that, they would be the same. So this is your audio, uh, Councilman Prowlis, and you know, I guess the show's yours, homeboy. Oh you woo? You woo? Hello? Hello. Yes. Um, yes, uh, I'm the neighbor uh, of this uh, person, of, of the applicant. Uh, I, I have been living in this area for over 10, uh, 11 years. So I supported his uh, initiative. Uh, I think this will bring, um, bring, you know, the have a little bit of contribution for the tight housing in San Jose. Uh, I know this is not affordable housing, but you know, but it's add up for uh, the city of San Jose to solve, uh, you know, more housing uh, problems and beneficial for the residents as well as for commercial usage. Um, you know, like first level of commercial. Thank you. I, this is my opinion. Thank you for your folks. I support it. Neil Knudsen. Good evening. Mayor and council members. My name is Danielle Knudsen and I live in the area as well. Um, just wanted to voice my support of the applicant. I think that um, while I respect the desire to attract the businesses over the years, the space has really gotten less and less uh, use. And I think this is just a more equitable and responsible use of the space in my neighborhood. So I support the amend or I support, support the applicant and the amendment, and I respectfully ask the mayor and the council to approve the general plan change to allow this to change into a live work development. Thank you. Call in user two. I mean, all this construction, all this building, where's the water going to come from? The roads, the, the electricity. You're, this city is not prepared for all this development, these stupid urban villages, and then you're having to bean count how much you know affordable housing you have and opportunity housing you have. The whole thing is just asinine, you know. And I don't, you know, I didn't totally agree with the other developer, but what I really didn't agree with was Sam shushing somebody because they used some foul language. Hey, hey Sam. I think your uh, your Catholic school that you went to in the grammar school, they they called. They want their rules back. I mean, if you guys can't handle a little foul language, one sorry, in a while, sir, we're talking we're about item ten point four. Back to council. All right, uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so when the property owner first came to me about this project, I had. Um, the same reaction I, I would have on any proposal that wants to convert commercial property. Um, then they proposed a live work uh, project that I was really skeptical about. And I know that staff is not feeling or loving live work projects because they turned out to be more or all live and no work. So we asked the the, the developer and the property owner to come back with uh, better designs that really enhanced the lived work you know model 
and particularly at the ground floor. We didn't want to have a design that was going to be easily converted to all live. And I felt that the developer came back with a proposal and a design that met my needs and, and my desires. So therefore, I shifted my position in terms of being opposed to the project, but I still had some concerns, uh, similar concerns with the uh, project in District 7. If we approve the um, general plan amendment, will they come back with a totally different project or will they come back with a all residential project? So the developer made a commitment that they will, and actually they have already made a, an appointment with planning to submit an application on April 25th for their project. Uh, it's not binding, and that's why we had in our, our memo the expectation that they would fall through. So we are making a leap of, of faith that they will um, live up to their commitment. But we are we did put some parameters around it. We made sure that they had they scheduled their appointment. They made you know firm commitments to, with us that they would move forward with the designs that they showed us uh, in advance. So therefore, I have the comfort level that they're going to meet that commitment. And that's why uh, myself, along with Council Member Prowlis, are moving forward with uh, the desire to approve this project. So I'd like to make a motion to accept our memo to move forward and approve this project. Or I should say the general, the general plan amendment. I'll second. All right, a motion and second from Councilmember Perales. Other questions or comments? Okay, and Ms. Bepidal, uh, with regard to the anticipated project, is, is, is that correct? And are you preparing to bring in a forklift project to the, to the planning department? Um, uh, yes, Mayor. Um, the applicant over the last two months, he has been signing contracts with um, seven different consultants to get the project through the site development process. And um, once uh, the council approves the general plan amendment, they're ready to move forward to the next phase. They already have all the contracts ready to go. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that the site development uh, process is underway. Um, I also note that this is clearly distinguishable from the last project. This is a very poor commercial site, no visibility. It's not on a corner, it's in fact on a it is largely a residential road with a cul-de-sac, so very, very little traffic uh, will actually see it. And now with the hotel redevelopment uh, immediately adjacent, looks like it will be an orphan parcel or a remnant. Uh, ordinarily, I think we'd want these parcels to be consolidated for redevelopment, but it does not look like that's gonna happen. So that makes the um, prospects for this as a traditional commercial parcel even worse. And so I'm gonna support this as a, an unusual exception because this is truly something that is uh, uh, about as close to infeasible as it gets on pure commercial. Uh, Councilman Jimenez? Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I, I, I sense this is different. I, I just had one question for Odessa. Odessa, uh, I know when we met, I didn't ask you this, but was there ever any consideration as it relates to selling this property to the hotel developer and seeing if they could just expand the hotel? Did that ever come up? Uh, I, I'm sure that was before your time, but. I'd be curious if that ever was a, a thing. Um, yeah, that was before my time, but I'm not aware of um, any consolidation from that parcel. Okay, and it probably is good anyway because the, the sort of step down as far as the height into the neighborhood, I think it's it's a good progression as opposed to just being a big six story or however tall the building is. So, okay, thank you. Exactly, and um, uh, to that point, we have a signature of support from our adjacent neighbors who are one story home. Uh, owners. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a wonderful All right. Evening. All right. Thank you. Uh, item 10.5 is a general plan amendment conforming rezoning on Keaton Loop. 
Thank you. So um, this is the last one of this annual review. It's a privately initiated general plan amendment for a um, 0.66 acre at Keaton Loop to change the land use designation from residential neighborhood to neighborhood community commercial. This is kind of going the other way, so it's a little bit of a change in what we've been hearing tonight. Um, and a conforming rezoning from agriculture to commercial pedestrian zoning district. Initial study was repaired. Uh, no impacts were identified. The planning commission, as well as the uh, staff, recommended that the city council um, find the proposal in conformance with CEQA and approve the proposed general plan amendments and rezoning. And that concludes staff presentation. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, is the applicant with us? What is the applicant's name? Good question. Anybody know the Al applicant's Caruso. Oh, Sal, okay. I just clicked promote, he needs to accept it. He's on his way over. Welcome, Sal. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. So hopefully this goes to balance a bit of the other general plan amendments tonight, <laughs> uh, adding tax base to the city of San Jose and in this beautiful district in Evergreen. And what we look at in this parcel, this is going to be an owner, predominantly owner occupied business. Uh, Rigo Bracamantes has been a member of this community for many years. I've worked with him now for about 15 years on various projects. And he's looking to make this uh, his, one of his headquarters and uh, we feel that it's a very complimentary project. And if you look at the general plan map, actually this particular parcel, when you unite it with the parcels kitty corner on either side, it actually consistently creates the color that is indicative of the commercial district. So it really completes the land use map in a positive direction and uh, creates, I think, a wonderful attribute to the community. And I'm here to answer any questions that there may be. Okay, thank you, Mr. Crusoe. Let's go to the public. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Mr. Crusoe, I like your back paneling door. That's beautiful. I, I, I like that. Um, stacking this these land issues at this time where the public cannot really get the full impact because I can feel the herd. As a matter of fact, there was actually a uh, uh, email that was generated to move it along. And so it's going to be interesting to see the reaction because my attorney is going to get a copy of this particular meeting. I'm going to make sure of it. Okay. And also, I would like to uh, thank Councilman Jimenez because he, he has perfected the art of articulating his position into the form of a question. And that is a sign of a good attorney, okay? I, I wish that I could do that. I don't have that skill and you could get class. All right, returning to the council, council member Renas. Thank you. Um, well, we, we are going to add some jobs. <laughs> Uh, to to our area with this uh, development. And so um, uh, the applicant has um, met with my community, has heard my community in, in terms of um, some of the uh, things that they would like. Um, and because this is an empty lot, hasn't been built, he's heard from us um, the they want a certain level of setbacks, um, not having driveways, um, access near um, some of the exits and entrances of folks. Um, they'll have installation of sidewalks and curbs. So this is something that's standard anyways, uh, uh, when you're, you're building out. Oh, am I still? Oh, there we are, sorry. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm going to support this. Um, um, and make a motion to approve. Um, I, I just ask uh, Mr. Caruso to continue to engage with our community um, as the application, once the application is submitted. Second. 
Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Mahan? Thank you. Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Mr. Thank Cruiser, you. Thank you for a succinct presentation. Prevails thank in you. the end. All right. Have a good we, uh, thank you. We now have time for uh, for open forum. Paul Soto. No, you don't have time, Mr. Mayor. You're going to make time for it. You will make time for open forum. And what I'd like to say to this council is to look at the uh, take a picture of the frontal part of Santa Clara University, the mission. Okay, and let your eyes go up above the door and focus in on the symbol that is at the apex of the mission. And what you will find is the answer to all of these issues that have been going on here. St. James Park, Reed Street, all of it. So I implore you, please do that. And then I have another symbol, the same exact symbol, sitting in back of, of course, St. Joseph's Basilica. The same exact symbol, look at the back door. When the priests walk out the back door of St. Joseph's Church, look at that symbol that's there, and you tell me who's in charge. Claire Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Blair Beekman here. Uh, I hope you've been noticing with all the new law enforcement questions that have been going around to all the major Bay Area cities at this time, San Francisco is in a bit of a mess with what they have to figure out with their law enforcement questions at this time. In San Jose, I think we're in a better space. Uh, and I think that's because we're trying to honestly address the questions of what can be open accountable practices with our law enforcement questions and our technology questions. So thank you for these good efforts. Uh, it is reimagined in health and human services and, and, and equity ideas that can really address our law enforcement questions at this time and, and organize, you know, a good, good practices for ourselves. So good luck in that continued good work that can help define the law enforcement questions at this time. Thank you. Call in user two. Bravo, City Council, bravo. How many hours and hours of long-winded garbage we've had to listen to? The open forum should be at the beginning, not at the end. Unbelievable what you people have done today. It's disgusting. You all disgust me so much. And yeah, you're going to reimagine law enforcement, all right, because who's going to take away the guns you don't like? Because it's going to happen. People aren't going to pay the fees or the insurance. Who's going to enforce it? Pam Foley, Sam LaCarta. Are you guys going to go kick people's doors in? Carrasco? How about Perales? He's a cop. Oh, that's right. He doesn't have to pay to have his gun or insure it, right? But he thinks you should if you're not part of his special little San Jose pot dealers club. Think about it. All right, on that enjoyable note, everybody have a great evening.